Who? You. I don't. That's, I that's, you, that's the misconception. Whenever, whenever, where you've always got your notes and you're always hitting on points, meaning that you've gone and checked out. I haven't. But I'm, I'm glad it, it appears that way. It makes me happy. Because I'd, I'd, prefer, I'd prefer you, you think that than the alternative, that I'm not prepped. People <laughs> really think I'm smart and I'm, yeah, I'm really you're, not. You're prepared. You prepare that illusion, homie. I, it's a better <laughs> illusion. It's better for people to be like, hey, Donna, we don't know who's funding this guy. It's just now we get shot from somewhere. Then people are like, uh, so I don't know. So it's better to be over. Someone spoke about being overhyped. I forgot who it was now. You'd prefer for people to actually think that you have people behind you that are powerful. Yeah. Um, then the alternative, where you're actually just on your own. Are you guys rolling? Are we good to go? Thank you very much. Officially, thank you, Humoto. Thank you, Cizwe, uh, Q, Yenzi, Debs, for all the work that we do. Protendo, welcome back, bro. How are you doing? Bro? Uh, I, I have to be cognizant of the fact that you're still a guest, and I have to give you the utmost respect. But it, you are a brother. You've been here all like so many times. Um, but I'd like to welcome you back again to the panel show, and I would like to thank you so much. You have helped our platform grow. <laughs> We're over 100,000 subscribers now. And when people ask about that, I'm like, I, I I do think it's a couple of people that have helped push us. And you've been, you might actually be the number one person that's pushed this platform to grow. You've made us relevant on the African continent. And for me personally, everywhere I go, there are so many Zimbabweans, specifically Zimbabweans that come up to me and they're like, hey, you know that Rutendo? <laughs> Most of them love you. And they say, I'm gonna send a shout out. So on their behalf, I want to send a shout out. Many of them are like, you must challenge Rutendo. I don't agree with him. My man, I'm from Zim and Rutendo's lying. And I'm like, okay, take it easy. Um, <laughs> but thank you for making this show and, and myself relevant. I appreciate you, bro. Like, and for real. thank you too. You you guys have amplified my voice. You've amplified my struggle. And I think now you have heard the issue of Zimbabwean sanctions being spoken by quarters and people that you never thought would say it. And uh, it's because of platforms like this. You have given us a voice where mainstream media had shut us out. And I appreciate that too. Thank you, bro. Platform is yours. Uh, we have to start with, oh wait, no, before we start with, how have you been doing? How, is, how has your voice been growing? How have you moved? Maybe you can give us highlights of the places you've been speaking at, your fight to uh, revitalize Zimbabwe in the eyes of so many people mm -hmm. and stop having ignorant South Africans be like, we're going to be like a Zimbabwe. <laughs> What's happening in Zim on the ground? Um, maybe you can even just speak about your personal life and, and how you've been moving. And then I'd like us to speak about the Zim elections. Wow. Um, a number of things have been happening. Um, my voice has become very loud to the extent that we actually had the Zambian government, or at least the Zambian ruling party, and let's say the government, having protests about me just about two weeks ago after the Zimbabwean elections, and they were under the impression that um, I was out to kill their current president and I was involved. Killing, killing literally. A, a former president. Yeah, exactly. Killing literally, not. They, they had a protest, the youth and the um, ruling party had a protest. And that protest ended up having a petition being given to a minister in the Copper Belt complaining about the fact that people like me had uh, instigated the killing of the current Zambian president because of his meddling in our elections, all of which is ludicrous. Mm. But I think it was more of the fact that I opened up people's eyes to the fact that there's a U.S. base in Zambia. And not only is there a U.S. base in Zambia, because the Zambians are calling it a, a, a U.S. AFRICOM office, but um, I was was the first person to expose that they've actually got military equipment going there. And soon after this protest that they had, four days, three days later, the United States government, we saw the uh, embassy in Zambia, we saw the AFRICOM head come all the way from Germany to Zambia, and we saw um, USAID sitting and having a conference in which they were now announcing that they're giving the Zambian government four um, Black Hawk helicopters, which the Zambians cannot fly, which they've not been trained to fly. And that was a clear example of how our expose had caused so much chaos that the Zambian government had to have some form of a protest all in a way to try and hide the fact that the Americans had put weapons in Zambia, hoping to invade Zimbabwe during the election period. But I'll explain that a little bit later. It's a, it's a high compliment, though, 
as much as it's false accusations and fake news, it's it's testament to the fact that you are having a, a real influence in real life. Then you've also got people like um, the Rwandans consistently putting pressure on my government to tell me to remove what I put on Twitter, to tell them to uh, force me to not say certain things. And I've had to get to a point where I've had to say to my government, you need to tell them that I don't work for you. Mm. I'm not a government employee. Even the fact that you keep calling me to ask me to remove what I put on my Twitter page um, that is affecting your diplomatic relations means that maybe you should start briefing me on diplomatic issues and start briefing me on such kind of issues if they're going to be calling you and asking you not to say certain things because you're afraid they're afraid that it's going to damage the diplomatic relations between Zimbabwe and Rwanda. It's, it shouldn't be like that. And I should be free to write what I write because I'm a pressure group, I'm a pressure activist. Mm -hmm. We are here to try and put pressure not only on foreign governments or foreign institutions, but even on our government so that it does certain things right. And right now you hear that SADC is thinking of deploying soldiers to Congo against M23 that's being funded by Rwanda. And my question to my government was, if you are going to deploy, then what happens with your friend, Rwanda and Kagame, who you are now going to be potentially fighting if SADC has to deploy and Zimbabwe deploys with SADC? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask a question about that. Officially, you've said before, but I'm just re rehashing. You do not work for the Zimbabwean government. You do not work for ZANU PF. However, you do have a relationship with many of the guys there, and it's a decent, good relationship. I'm upset because the work you're doing is to shine a light on Zimbabwe to get investors in to ensure that sanctions are removed. So for that reason, you get along with the Zimbabwean government and you're not hostile towards them as so many other people are. And on record, they have I have been offered a job in 2019 by okay. the government of Zimbabwe. Um, we didn't agree on a number of issues, hence I, I wasn't interested. And many people have thought that I do what I do because I want to be noticed by the government so that I can be offered a job. You've been offered, you've been noticed before. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, in 2019, I was actually flown out to Arare to have a very important meeting with a critical uh, department there, but we couldn't agree on terms. We had another secondary meeting here in Johannesburg and still we could not agree. And we're still now, I've built a very big profile continentally, I am not interested in working for the government of Zimbabwe because it would muzzle my position, it would muzzle my voice. I would not be able to undertake the current fight I'm undertaking against sanctions. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to go to court against uh, the South African banks. And guess what, Biden, Joe Biden responded to our papers in South African courts and he's now asking Durko to give him immunity. And we are saying, thank God for you to ask Durko for immunity because we're going to challenge you on the same precedence that was set with Grace Mugabe when Grace Mugabe has offered you uh, immunity by Durko, but Afri Forum went to challenge it in court and the court decided that Grace Mugabe shouldn't have been given immunity. We are now saying Joe Biden cannot be asking for immunity in South African courts where he gets immunity only for him to write executive orders and sanctions, which he then threatens and coerces South African companies to break South African laws to implement his sanctions. He's committing a crime and forcing South Africans to commit crimes. So we don't believe that he should be given immunity. Please, That's please simplify that for people. What do you mean by immunity? <laughs> right. So when we when we went against the banks in South Africa, we notified uh, and cited Joe Biden, um, Secretary of State, uh, the Department of, uh, um, As of Foreign Assets uh, Control, which belongs to the Treasury, and also Nancy Pelosi. And this, we this was representing Zimbabwe to say that South African banks are, are not acting in good faith. They are assisting in the sanction business. They are implementing sanctions yeah. and uh, they are blocking people's accounts, blocking payment clearances and blocking uh, 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 banking relations with Zimbabwe okay. on the basis of implementing U.S. sanctions, which have been said to be illegal by the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So we then went to the South African courts and we are applying for a declaratory order that says that South African banks cannot implement illegal sanctions that the United Nations has said are illegal. And the United Nations wrote a report that is called AHRC 5133, in which they actually say that no third party countries or their companies can implement illegal unilateral sanctions mm -hmm. because it's illegal.
So what we are saying to the courts in South Africa is you have to write a declaratory order that say South African banks or any institution or financial institution cannot implement illegal unilateral sanctions. Yeah. And so Biden, because he needs the South African banking system to continue to implement US sanctions and anti-money laundering regulations, he answered to the papers after 13 months to say that, first of all, the South African courts have no bearing on him or this issue. And it is that this issue that makes the issue complicated, where he's saying that South African courts have no bearing on US sanctions that are being implemented in South Africa by South African institutions. He gets that wrong because his executive orders enjoin countries outside America and Americans not to materially assist the government of Zimbabwe, not to make payment clearances for the government of Zimbabwe, and not to give technology, uh, logistics. And once he does that, he's now forcing South African companies, South African banking institutions and financial institutions to implement his illegal sanctions and break South African law, which says no one can be uh, discriminated, no one's rights can be taken away from them. And of course, no one can be punished without trial. And sanctions are punishment without trial. Mm -hmm. And Biden is forcing South African banks and institutions to do that because they cry that if we don't do it, we get penalized. However, yeah. having said that, they are lying because in Zimbabwe, we had a bank that ignored all US sanctions mm -hmm. 15,400 times. They got penalized and they decided to take it on review. They went to courts and they got one of the biggest law firms in the world to take the issue on. The American government recognized that they were on the wrong and they canceled all the penalties. $300 million worth of penalties that mm. they had penalized this bank, which had been taken down from $3.5 So that precedent set by the Zimbabwean bank illustrates that banks can challenge the American action and penalties and they can win, illustrating that you can't enforce an, in, an illegality. And that's what we hope that South African banks have to start doing against the Americans as well. And, and Biden wanted immunity to be like, allow me to carry on. And if ever there's an issue, I want to be isolated as I'm allowed to do this compared to other people. He basically is saying, South African courts, you don't have any bearing on me. You don't have any authority to ask me questions or to hold me accountable. And Durkham has officially... Durkham has given that stance. immunity. And we are saying that the South African courts have got every right to question his executive orders, yeah. if those executive orders are what are forcing South African institutions to implement his sanctions, even if they want, didn't want to implement the sanctions. So it's gonna be interesting that for the first time, an American president is being held accountable in an African court by Africans for sanctions that he wants to force yeah. other people to implement. And ultimately, it's also going to have bearing on the implementation of, uh, what do we call it, um, um, anti-money laundering regulations. Mm -hmm. As you can see, Sekunjalo has been whipping the banks in the, in, in, in the courts. I don't know and about whipping, but they they at least fighting back. They're fighting back and, and the courts have made rulings that stop mm -hmm. their bank accounts from being closed. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be very important. It goes to speak to, you said, what are other things you are doing? I went to a conference in which I had to make a presentation to the African bar of lawyers mm -hmm. uh, at UNISA. And I was telling the African bar that we cannot have a situation where South African banks can become the spanner in the works of the Africa continental free trade area where they have so much power, so much dominance that has been acquired from apartheid, a crime against humanity, then they use this muscle that they get from a crime against humanity to implement US sanctions on the continent and to bar development of black and African peoples by blocking their accounts arbitrarily on the basis that they're implementing uh, uh, anti-money laundering regula regulations mm -hmm. or closing the accounts of perps, politically exposed persons, or closing the accounts of people that are alleged to be money laundering, and usually those would be black Africans, while the white monopoly companies and the Glencores that actually have been caught undertaking crimes or financial crimes don't have their accounts blocked mm. and don't have any form of de-risking taking place. It's a form of racism. South African banks are a threat the Africa, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement because their job is to stop black businesses from developing and to give white businesses in South Africa and from the West an advantage over the Chinese, the Russians, and Africans. And that shouldn't be acceptable. And that's what I said at um, the... Um, Did they respond? They wouldn't respond. What, what was interesting is there's a lady who <laughs> called me um, soon after I did I did something on TV and, and a lady called me and she said that she is responsible for seeking talent to talk at um, 
at uh, banking institutions uh, conferences. Mm. And she invited me to talk at an APSA conference. And I th- said, what do we have in common with APSA? Why would APSA want me to speak yeah. at their event? Because we don't have anything in common. Yeah. But what, what is happening though is something interesting. Um, the Zimbabwean government was given loans recently mm. by two South African banks, APSA and Standard Bank. Okay. And they offered the Zimbabwean government $192 million dollars to build hospitals and clinics. Okay. APSA and Standard Bank and no South African bank has offered the Zimbabwean government any loans ever since sanctions began in 2001. Mm. And so we believe that this was the banking system trying to mitigate what we're doing by going to the Zimbabwean government, offering them loans. And we believe they also offered them loans for the Bait Bridge border project. Mm. But they're doing this after we started the case. And the question is, why now? You haven't been given this government money for 22 years. You said it was unbankable. It was under sanctions. High so risk, what happened to the stability? 100. What happened to the sanctions now? So we believe that they have made a deal with our government to say we will give you this, but try and make sure that the case in South Africa doesn't go ahead. You see. So whenever we need, that's, that's just a conspiracy theory. We need so, to officially state that. It's it's a it's a conspiracy theory. I'm trying but, to protect you, but there are bases for us to say it. I hear you. You know, and so that is the interesting thing. Not only that, we've got nine or eleven banking corresponding banking relationships that have been reinstated between the time we instituted the case and now. Mm. And uh, we're saying this is interesting. We haven't been having Zimbabwe creating corresponding banking relationships for 22 years. Yeah. In fact, they've been getting cancelled, and then all of a sudden these banks are starting to come back to reinstituting corresponding banking relationships because of the pressure coming from this case. So there is monetary benefits that have already started accruing from the work that we're doing in the courts in South Africa and the activism, this pressure activism that I keep telling my government about to say, you can't muzzle me because mm-hmm. what I do might not be suitable from a, 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 a diplomatic perspective, yes. but in real terms, it puts pressure on even the enemies of Zimbabwe to sometimes do things that will advantage the government. But it's a double-edged sword. Mm. There are times I'm going to criticize the government and the government is also going to have to either yield, change, or modify the way it works Mm. um, to suit the Zimbabwean people in areas where we as the Zimbabwean people are not happy. You looked at the way they created the Patriotic Act. Mm. We put pressure on the Patri- uh, to create the Patriotic Act. We proposed it, then we lobbied, and then people in Zano PF who felt it was a good idea to punish Zimbabweans who go outside Zimbabwe to the United States, to the U.S. Congress, to ask for sanctions. The Zano PF officials thought that was a good idea. They created the law. Mm. So that's what pressure activism is about. NGOs non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations work both ways. It's not only the Americans that can put these into our countries and use them against our governments. Mm. We also can have locally based civil society organizations that work in the national interest to pressure not only our government, but even foreign governments from the things that they've been doing. You've got me thinking about a lot of things. I want to start off by highlighting because people will assume that it's just Zimbabweans that get discriminated by South African banks. And what you're speaking about is not just Zimbabweans. You're speaking about all Africans or Africans that are pro-Africa, pan-African, pro-Black. We've had Tutuzane Zumo's had his accounts closed. Iqbal's survey of Segunjalo, they tried, he's fought back. It would be nice to actually get a list of all the people um, who have had their accounts frozen. Julius Malema. Julius Malima was another guy that I saw in the media as well. Yeah. And uh, the fact Ciro that Ramaphosa's son. Andile Ramaphosa Andile as well. Ramaphosa. Um, and, you, and you're very correct. People like Marcus Yosta at Steinhoff, the guys at Glencorp, nothing has ever happened. So we need to, <laughs> people need KPMG, to research that. KPMG, nothing happened. Deloitte. <laughs> Deloitte, well. AOL. Um, I, wanted to t- I wanted you to touch on, I'm just triggered by the last thing you said, but I wanted you to touch on you, you spoke about the Zimbabwean government and getting involved in the DRC and the conflicts and how that might have an issue with Rwanda. It's something that's been raised on platforms. People that follow these things know these things inside out. But for a person hearing you for the first time, visiting us for the first time, what are you talking about? What conflict in the DRC? Mm. Who is Zimbabwe sending? What does it have to do with Rwanda at all? 
Right. Wow. Um, so what is ironic is that, you know, we had elections. Um, yes. And these elections that we had, we have a Zambian president who is a partisan, who is the head of the SADC organ. That is the organize, uh, that is the organ that is um, responsible for defense issues and political issues within for, Southern. For the entire SADC. SADC. Okay. So it's being headed right now by a Zambian. It, it changes every single, um, and three year, I mean, every year. Okay. So he sent a guy through to the Zimbabwe to monitor the Zimbabwean elections as the head of the Zimbabwean monitoring mission. Okay. This person he sent is a former vice president of Zambia who was a vice president of a president that when we had elections in 2008 wanted to allow the British government to actually invade the Zimbabwe from Zambia after there was a disputed election and Robert Mugabe won what were called the runoff elections because the first elections had no clear winner. So the Zambian president called Mwanawasa decided that he was going to then allow the British who asked like they did to Thabo in 2002. In 2008, they went and asked um, the Zambian president then Mwanawasa, can we invade Zimbabwe to remove Robert Mugabe? This is a real Zambia. story that people can research. Yeah, it's a real okay. story. It's okay. a real story. And it was... It was well articulated by... This is now recent. Yeah. Uh, um, so recent is the deputy president yes. of the president of 2008 who wanted to allow the British to attack Which Zimbabwe. was in 2008. Yes. That's recent. And you're right. saying the British wanted to yeah. in 2008. Mm. Well, okay. well, the story goes that they initially... So so, so let's, let, let, let me make it clear how, sure. how this thing works. And then we'll get to the Congo issue. Okay. Because they're all related. So we get to 1999. Mm. Robert Mugabe has announced in 1997 that we're going to take land. So that's after South Africa has gotten its constitution. Mm. South Africa has got its freedom. Mm. South Africa writes its constitution. And Zimbabwe was holding its land reform since 1990 and was holding, changing its constitution to take land to allow the uh, uh, South Africans ANC and other uh, liberation parties to get independence because um, 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 you had a um, Commonwealth head who was there, a, a, a professor, um, a chief, uh, Anyuku mm -hmm. from Nigeria. He said to Zimbabwe, listen, this is 1990. Zimbabwe has not been undertaking land reform and has been undertaking willing buyer, willing seller for the past 10 years from 1980 to 1990. Mm -hmm. But the agreement of the Lancaster House says that once you get to 1990, after 10 years, you can end willing buyer, willing seller, create a new constitution and stop using the Lancaster House constitution, create a new constitution that allows you to take land. Yeah. So uh, Ameka Anyuku comes and says he is the chief, uh, is a chief in Nigeria and he's the head of the Commonwealth. Says to Zimbabwe, hold on. Our South African brothers want to get independence. The Boers are ready to negotiate. If you guys start taking land, you might spook the Boers to say, we can't as accept independence in South Africa because then these guys are going to take our land. So why don't you hold your land reform, allow ANC and the other liberation movements to negotiate CODESA, and once power has transferred to South Africa, then you as Zimbabwe can change your constitution and then take land. Okay. So Mugabe accepts, and they wait. But while they wait, they create a small little act called the Land uh, uh, Appropriation, Land Appropriation, Land Acquisition Act, that's in 1992 that says they will start taking land that they want. They'll simply look at a piece of land that they want and say, we want this one. They notify the farmer and within one year, the farmer must leave and they can pay him now in Zim dollars instead of foreign currency. Mm -hmm. And the pricing of the farm is not done by private uh, 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 real estate agents as they were doing before. Yeah. So that is shelved, but it was done to please the war veterans that had gone to war who mm. wanted the land. South Africa then gets independence, 1994. Robert Mugabe is negotiating with the British to say, we're going to start taking land. But as we take land, we're going to compensate your sons and daughters with what we think the land is worth. Mm. If you believe that the money we're giving is not enough, you then have to top up and give your children what they need so that they can retire without having to come to the United Kingdom where you have to look after them. But the British government, there was backs and forths, back and forth. So we have a John Major government in Britain gets replaced by Tony Blair by the time we get to 1997. 
The South Africans have written their constitutions, or you guys have written your constitution in 1996. So Zimbabwe says, South Africa is free. South Africa has got a constitution. We can now start going full steam to now take our land, which has already been delayed by seven years. Mm -hmm. So Robert goes to the British, to Tony Blair, and says, you guys have to give us money to give your sons and daughters so that we can be able to take our land. Tony Blair... Claire Short, who was his, I think, his foreign minister, she says, listen here, we are a nation made up of people, Irish, Scottish, some of them have been colonized, and they've never been compensated by us, and we cannot honor an agreement that you had with the previous government. So Mgabe said, no problem, it's fine. We're going to take our land. Your sons and daughters, they can look out for themselves, but we're now taking our land. Mm -hmm. So... We, this is 1997. So the the, the, the the Western community says, oh, hold on, Robert, before you start taking land, let's have a conversation and a negotiation. Let's have a land conference where we as donors will come and we'll see how we can help you. Then Mugabe said, but we already had an agreement at Lancaster. Why are we renegotiating sure. an agreement you haven't honored? The we, British we've are got a leader currently who loves having committees and things on <laughs> things that have been discussed many, many times before. Setting up a new minister of things setting up a new, let's sit and discuss. What are you discussing? 100%. Sure. So remember, all these things you need to, I want you to keep in your mind that while this is happening, there are other things happening in the background. Yeah. So Mugabe then refuses the new agreement. The far, white farmers are saying, no, you guys can take 3 million hectares of land and then we will give uh, those 10 million, 3 million hectares uh, to the Zimbabwe, to, to, to black people and then we will give three billion dollars to these Zimbabwean people to help them to farm and all this nonsense and Mugabe said no you haven't honored what we agreed on the first time around yeah. there's no chance that you're going to honor trust this. You anymore. I don't trust you anymore yeah. right so while this is happening 1989 1898 they have no agreement on this new conference uh, new land reform thingy so the British start f using what is called the Westminster Democracy Fund to start funding civil society in Zimbabwe. Um, George Soros creates what is called the Open Society uh, of Southern Africa. And a number of other institutions start budding. The white farmers of Zimbabwe create a fund and start funding the creation of civil society. This civil society then turns into an opposition party that is called Movement for Democratic Change. By civil society, you're talking non-profit organizations? Non-profit organizations. Okay. So we've got a broad-based civil alliance non-profit organization that's created, headed by a guy that's called Brian Kagoro, who everybody's now beginning to watch on Twitter, talking from a pan-African perspective, talking about how Israel was compensated. He was the head of this institution that was created specifically to stop land reform. Their job was to ensure that the Zimbabwean government cannot create a new constitution to take land. But they, were, but they were selling a good story. They were saying, look, the whites are willing to come to the table Let's negotiate. This is what we'll do. They didn't Wrong. talk about the land. They, they simply the said land that a new constitution would give Mugabe a presidency of a lifetime. And oh, that's going so to be Mugabe bad. So Mugabe is evil. Yes. He's trying to stay in power. He's trying to stay in Fight power. whatever he's trying to do. He's going to pretend like he wants to give you <laughs> land that you want. Okay. I hear right. You. So that's what they were doing. While they were doing that, a bunch of them then formed an opposition party called Movement of Democratic Change. Mm -hmm. Movement of Democratic Change comes into existence 1999, November. But two months before that, the British government, the American government, and their European counterparts start denying the Zimbabwean government loans from the IMF and the International Development Association, which had already approved loans for road construction, infrastructure development. They then withheld those loans mm. two months before the creation of MDC. And two months from there, we're in, we're in November, we're supposed to have elections in March. Not only were we supposed to have elections in March 2000, we were also supposed to have a referendum on whether the Zimbabwean people want to actually change the constitution of Zimbabwe in February of 2000. Mm. So these civil society organizations, well funded by the West, then tell people not to vote for uh, this new uh, constitution. And they also basically create a new opposition that's telling the Zimbabwean people not to elect ZANU-PF. Yeah. So we leave Who that Who was there. in charge? Was it Morgan at that time? It was Morgan Changira. Changira. Yeah, he was the head of uh, the opposition, which was created by white farmers and the British government, by the way. Not civil society of, of Zimbabwe as such. It was okay. actually instigated by the CIA, the MI6, and so forth. But while that's happening, in the background, something is happening as well. Zimbabwe has deployed its soldiers alongside Angola and Namibia to go and fight in Congo against Rwandan-funded rebels 
who in many ways were actually Rwandan uh, 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 army and Ugandan army who had been sent into Congo by the West to go and remove Laurent Kabila, who had become a president who wanted to take the resources of the country and give it to his people. And he had been assisted to get into power by removing Mabutu Sese Seko by the same Rwandans and the Ugandans. But there was an agreement that, listen here, you're going to go into power, take over from Mabutu Sese Seko, then you're going to take some of my guys, you know, some of my Rwandan military officials, and put them into your government and into your system mm. so that they could be more or less like proxies of Rwanda. Of course, because, I mean, we've helped you gain power, so we, <laughs> we need to benefit. We need to get payments. That 100%. That's probably the agreement. And not only did they want payment, Rwanda is a small country mm. with no mineral resources, and it needed something to develop off. So they needed the eastern part of Congo, which is quite rich in resources, mm. as part of their territory that they were going to be able to get resources from in order to pay for the assistance they gave Laurent Kabila, mm. but more critically, in order to also assist them to grow their country. Sure. Right? Okay. So when, when, when that happened, they sent their troops. Their troops went all the way and got into uh, uh, Kinshasa. This close to removing Laurent Kinshasa Kabila. Kinshasa is the capital of the DRC. Of DRC. Yeah. So Laurent Kabila ran to, to, to Zimbabwe, which at that time had Mugabe as the head of the SADC organ mm. that currently Hachilema is sitting on now. So as head of the SADC organ, SADC organ was created by independent frontline states that were built by revolutionary movements to actually fight imperialism collectively. Mm. So there was this what what we call common defense pact that they always had to defend each other. Hence, we were able to defend, to work together to remove the apartheid government by going to war against it in Mozambique, Angola, uh, Namibia, and Zimbabwe. Yeah. So that same principle is the principle in 1996 they used to create the SADC organ. Okay. So Mugabe, being the head of the SADC organ, Here's Congo, which is a member of SADC, saying we're being attacked by the Rwandans and the Ugandans and Burundians. Mm. We need your help. Otherwise, they're going to remove the current president. Robert Mugabe then in convenes a meeting as quickly as possible in August of uh, 1998, and immediately they agree to deploy soldiers. Did but, Kabila renege on the agreement he had with Uganda and Rwanda? Was he in the wrong? Because... <laughs> Based on the story you're telling me, it's almost like, look, we're going to help you gain power. But after you gain power, you have to look out for us. And maybe there was a some kind of selling out at the end with a... I think, I did think the Rwandans and the Ugandans, maybe, and the Burundians get greedy I or think want the, more? It's a, you ask a good question. I think the issue is on leaders who make decisions for nations okay. without the authority of that nation. So in but as much as Kabila, nation, Kabila, Kabila needed to, well, the authority of the nation are the people in a democracy. What your people want is what moves. But what happened is you, Kabila you made that? I do. Because what happened now is it was untenable for Kabila to honor what he had promised before he was elected as president. And now he gets into power and his people don't want to see Rwandans in their military system. They don't want foreigners to be sitting there telling their nation that it's okay to allow Rwandans to come and loot our nation and to loot the resources of our nation. So he made an agreement that made sense when he was in the bush without the mandate of the people. But the moment he got into power, it didn't make Makes sense for him to have foreigners looting the resources of the people that have given him a mandate to protect their resources. This is where the problem came. May I please intervene if you don't mind? Because now you, you're making me think about the ANC government and the agreements that were made with maybe apartheid South Africa, some wealthy South Africans that are white, and maybe the West and other people. Because this is why I asked, do you, do you believe that the people should give the mandate? And the, the majority of black South Africans who constantly give a mandate to the leadership are, are almost never considered. And it becomes a situation where, let's say, let's say Kapila actually honored the agreements. We're making, I'm making assumptions. I don't know how true all of this stuff is. If it honored the agreements, it's like, I don't care how you guys feel. The Minister of Defense is going to be from Rwanda. The Minister of Foreign Affairs is going to be from uh Uganda, etc. And we're like, that's rubbish. This is our land. These are our resources. Who the hell are these people? And you can try and explain, look, we had an agreement. It's like, no, this is ours. They must go back to wherever they came from. And you commit, which is 
arguably what the ANC has done. Until debatable, Zuma came and said, I don't know if this is what the people want and we want a new deal. And it's like, this is not what we agreed on. Bring well, Cyril in to honor the agreements we made all the way back in Codesa. And, and could we argue that it's something like that? It's something very similar to that. But the people of, but, of but, the DRC were like, we don't want these guys here. But Kapila had made a deal. And then Kapila was like, I need to put my people first. And the Rwandans and Ugandans and Burundians were like, nah. So if you won't respect us, we're coming in. But let me give you now a perfect example of why where South Africa is closer to the Rwandan situation than you actually realize, uh, the, the, the Congolese situation to what you realize. So pacts were made with uh, the ANC and the white government. There and, are no pacts and, between and, lions and, and, and men. Do you watch movies? <laughs> Not really. Sorry, that's from Troy Achilles. There are no pacts between lions and men. Right. So now, on the back, on, in the background, were the people who actually liberated South Africa. And uh, you and I have talked about this so much that it was the border wars that defeated the Boers that led the Boers to come and negotiate for the ANC to take over. But the countries that were involved, uh, the the Cubans, the Angolans, the Zimbabweans the Namibians, who fought wars on different fronts to weaken the apartheid government for its defeat and ultimate defeat in Angola, were not invited to the negotiating table. So the ANC made a lot of pacts. They allowed the maintenance of the disinformative and propaganda advancing apartheid media. An apartheid media that continues to advance apartheid propaganda that said black people are incapable, black people cannot control the country. They allowed the formation of a judiciary that would maintain decisions that would suit the maintenance of the apartheid system, and they allowed the whites to keep an economy. That uh, the economy and to continue the in the industry and these apartheid companies running South Africa and then influencing and also jumping into. Sadek countries and destroying Sadek companies and competition. Now, all this has worked for South Africa until now, where we're going into an election next year, where the DA has a very big advantage because the apartheid system that had gone underground is stronger today than it was ever before, stronger than it was when it went to negotiate with the ANC. And now it actually is brave enough to feel that it's going to take over if the DA can get enough votes, and then the EFF can also get enough votes together with all some other smaller parties. There is talk from the EFF, from the DA, that they can actually push out the ANC and begin to govern the system. And they'll replace the police heads, they'll replace the heads of the army, and they'll replace the system. And guess who's the biggest partner in that? The DA is the biggest. So they are going to actually have a sway. And once the DA are in, it's more or less like the apartheid system back again. And you've heard Herman Mashaba say clearly that if we come in, we're going to sanction Zimbabwe, we're going to sanction ZANU PF heads. It's going to be a re-maintenance or a reinstitution of the former apartheid system. What that's going to do now is it's going to force SADC countries, which are already preparing now, to go to war if the DA comes into power. They are already preparing for the pre-apartheid system where they have is to Is this a real thing that we can read about somewhere? Or is well, this just conversations on the side? Let me tell you something controversial. Okay. But it has to be said. Recently, the Zimbabwean government received helicopters, uh, medical helicopters from the Russians. Medical? Are you calling them medical? That's what they're called. They're called medical helicopters. They're called medical I was, helicopters. I was there in St. Petersburg when Putin handed the keys to the chopper to the one chopper huge right? huge black beautiful but that was that, that chopper came after oh these are not 18, the medical yes, helicopters 18. oh the medical and helicopters the, are something else not what i saw not what you saw oh please continue right so there are some people who are already speculating that those medical helicopters can be repurposed it's oh, an this arms is why we war. ask if they are medical yeah, it's there's an arms war already taking place, an arms race already taking place. Countries around South Africa have always allowed South Africa to have more weapons to maintain a balance in which South Africa under the ANC is going to be the master of the of the, of the the area. Zimbabwe was even denied um, Generation 5 fighter jets so that South Africa can maintain its position. And they agreed to do that because they are hand in hand with the ANC. But now there is a chance 
that a DA government might control the Army of South Africa, the Air Force of South Africa, and we should have dominance over Southern Africa and start to push Southern Africa to its will as we had before, and the Zimbabwe government had to arm itself to protect itself from that army. This is what is happening in the region. Please press a, put a semicolon there because we're jumping far ahead. <laughs> Kabila goes to Zimbabwe. Mugabe. Mugabe is head of SADC. Please come and assist me. Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi are here. I'm, I'm bringing this back to even to, today yeah. where we've got issues with the DRC. Yes. And the DRC is probably one of the most painful countries on the continent along with Sudan. Yeah. Uh, so, and I just wanted you to add clarity for people that may not be aware. Very Why good. would you speak about the DRC and Zimbabwe and Rwanda? What is the link? Right. So there's still conflicts and Rwanda still feels they are owed whatever was agreed upon in the DRC and Zimbabwe today has to kind of decide whether they want to help Rwanda or not. No, so so right now, Rwanda, Rwanda, so Zimbabwe deployed okay. with Namibia. They got there just before the uh, rebels of Rwanda uh, could remove Laurent Kabila. Now, uh, we call them we call Kagame, them rebels because they military always, people. Oh, and, and I was about to go there. So Sorry. Kagame always say they are rebels. Those are not my army officials. But James Kabarebe, who was one of the uh, uh, commanders and leaders of his military now, and he's just been made, I think, foreign minister, mm -hmm. was the one who was heading the rebel force to try and remove Kabila. And they clashed for the first time with the Zimbabwean army at an airport in, in, in Kigali where they took one half of the airport, Zimbabwe took the other half of the airport. The Zimbabweans would fill the, airport, the, the, the planes here, load bombs there, and the airplanes would take off and go and bomb down at the end of the airport. And they would do this for a day or two until James Kabarembe's guys were actually defeated and they had to move out of uh, Kinshasa and then the war then went to the eastern part was of Congo. Kinshasa or Kigali? You said Kigali. Kinshasa. Kinshasa. That was a, the Kigali was a mistake. Uh, this was wasn't mistake. happening in Rwanda. This wasn't happening in Rwanda. It was, it was happening, happening in the DRC. In, in the DRC where yes. they were fighting at the airport. Okay. Hundred okay. percent. So they were fighting at the airport in Kinshasa, right? Mm. And the guy who was heading this rebel force yeah. was actually someone who was a head in the uh, Rwandan military. Not only were they doing that, they were trying to f bomb what is called the Inga Dam to break to to to, to stop electricity supply to Congo. And there were so you... many things at once. And, you know, <laughs> I, I wish I could. I don't want to stop you, but people need to understand these things because most people don't. You know, the... Paul Kagame is a polarizing figure for people that understand history because everyone's just like he's amazing. And you're like, I don't know if you know history and how things have been done. The second thing is I want to emphasize that whenever people hear rebel forces, whenever people hear insurgents, whenever people hear terrorists, for a critical thinker, that is meant to be a red flag to say, go research. Go research who said these are rebels, insurgents, terrorists. And these supposed rebels, insurgents, terrorists, who do they represent? Who benefits if they win? Who benefits if they lose? So that you can decide for yourself if this is really a rebel. I mean, Nelson Mandela was a terrorist. Yes. The ANC was a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. The Inga Dam helps supply electricity to the DRC and... Other people, African countries. And other African countries. And for people that don't know, there's a project called the Grand Inga Dam that if it was to be done fully to its completion, can power the entire African continent. Forget ESCOM, which already powers, I don't know how many countries on the continent, but the Grand Inga Dam project, if done properly, I know Remgro and Johan Rupert have invested. I, I'm, I'm, I could be mistaken, but I think Cyril and Shanduga and them have a stake. If it could be done properly, it can power the entire African continent, forget nuclear energy, forget coal. Sorry, my apologies. Please Very continue. Very good. And so, and so at, the, at Inga Dam were commandos from Uganda and some from uh, uh, Rwanda as well who wanted to bomb the dam in order to stop electricity in Congo and to make sure that the country goes up in chaos. The Zimbabwean Air Force played a huge part in driving the uh, uh, Ugandans and Rwandans out of that and stopped them from bombing the Inga Dam and then pushing them all the way back from the eastern part, uh, from the western part of Congo, back into the eastern part of Congo that's closer to their countries. 
they they wanted to bomb the Inga Dam to stop electricity supply. Yes. As an act of terrorism. As an act of terrorism. To stop the country from Function. progressing, functioning. Making it ungovernable. I just want to add a piece there that it becomes a question mark as well why we have load shedding, mm. why we're struggling with <laughs> whatever we're struggling with in this country that could it be acts of what we call terrorism because we are the uh, victims of whatever's happening and where is it coming from? Who makes money from load shedding? Who makes money from a South Africa that's not functioning? Is this another Inga Dam potential bomb <laughs> but it's been done in a more intelligent more way? More intelligent way, yeah. Sabotage. Yeah. And what is interesting is that a lot of people have always said the reason why Nelson Mandela did not deploy the SNDF together with Zimbabwe, Namibia, and uh, Angola when SADC deployed is that there are allegations that some of the guys that were giving the weapons to Uganda and Rwanda were actually South African mercenaries from the former SADF who were assisting the rebels on behalf of Western powers and Western countries. Because and, they didn't want Kabila to give his people the minerals. Yes. And because South African companies, particularly at that time, Glencoe, controlled a great number of the mining companies that were making money without submitting any taxes mm. by looting Congo because it was not organized. And so it works for them when rebels are operating. Correct. So let's now speed this up. So because of this war that disrupted the looting of Congo, that disrupted the ability to remove this leader who had become a problem for the West, Zimbabwe was targeted for sanctions. And that's where you see the first sanctions I told you about in 1999, mm -hmm. two months before the creation of MDC, you see them stop giving Zimbabwe loans from the IMF, loans from the International Development Association. It was a means to cripple the Zimbabwean army to get it out of Congo. That was one of the mm -hmm. uh, 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 objectives. The second objective was to stop land reform. Zimbabwe mustn't get land. And the way they wanted to do this is to pressure the Zimbabwean government by taking away its ability to have money to balance its payments, but more critically to disappoint and to depress the Zimbabwean economy so much so that when we get to elections in 2000, mm. uh, uh, May, they would have voted the Zimbabwean government out, gotten the new movement of democratic change that was created by NGOs and civil societies like George Soros civil societies mm -hmm. to come into power and then reverse everything that the ZANU-PF government was doing. That, and that's that why- That turns you into um, a villain though. Um, you spoke about the Patriotic Act, which sounds good from your perspective. It cannot be that as a family, we've got someone in the family who's constantly going into the streets, talking rubbish about us. And asking when, for when, attack. When we go and ask, when we go and apply for jobs, when we go and take out loans, they're like, no, but someone from your home has told us that you guys are abusive. Your dad's an alcoholic. There's no way. And you're saying we are going to sit and act in this house that anyone who speaks ill of our family, we, we, what's it called? Disown. We're going to disown them and we're going to publicize it. So that people are like, anytime I hear Rutendo speaking about Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans have said he's not one of us. So don't judge us based on him. No. Sounds good. It's no, 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 I'm just saying as, yeah. a, as a concept. Okay. But for some people, that's where they start speaking about limiting freedom of speech. Uh, you're not allowed to criticize North Korea. We've got a North Korean here. And people are like, no, but this person was sent by the West. I'm just saying this is how you create a villain from a Western perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From a Western perspective. To be like, this patriotic act is not a legit thing to say you're speaking ill of the country. This is to throttle objective, impartial <laughs> analysis of what's happening in the country. Yeah. But in the impartial objective analysis, and this is what we want people to understand is when that person speaks out about Nangagwa and ZANU-PF and the, when they speak out, does that help Zimbabweans or does it worsen the situation? And Not that's what people need to think when they, hear these things not only that the question is let's look at what happened when you've gone to speak out all along right mm -hmm. so you look at this issue where i've just created a picture for you that a bed was laid for an opposition to take over power mm -hmm. so that we reverse zimbabwe's uh, 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 uh foreign policy and we reverse zimbabwe's internal policy of taking land and restitution to blacks correct and these are all factors that now you as South Africans are all facing right now. Correct. 
you are now looking at you want some people want radical economic transformation some people want land back because the country is not growing even though white people have been allowed to keep everything and you also got foreign policy decisions like do we partner with the russians do we partner the chinese that are the biggest traders we are having at two at 60 billion or do we traders align to, sorry. T- trade between south africa and china so you guys are currently I trying to decide. I want to with you. I know they're a big trade partner. I just don't know if they've overtaken the U.S. But they please o- continue. No, they overtook the, the U.S. a long time ago. Please continue. Right. People so will, now you will guys argue are, with me or you in the comments. So you guys are playing around with those decisions from a government perspective yeah. with people that have got diplomatic understanding, foreign policy understanding. All of a sudden, you've got two South Africans not elected by the South African people. Boom, they go to Congress and they start making statements and decisions that South Africa needs more NGOs to put pressure on the government and you need to fund more NGOs. But yet South Africans back home are complaining that NGOs are stopping us from taking away hijacked buildings. NGOs are stopping us from chasing away illegal foreigners. And now you've got two individuals going to make decisions for government and make decisions with a foreign government. That's where you guys are beginning to understand what Zimbabwe has been dealing with. And South Africans are not happy that Ridi Tlabi and Chris, Chris Maroleng, who happens to be a Zimbabwean, have gone to represent South African issues to a foreign government without authority from the South African people, without being elected by the South African people. That's what Zimbabweans have been fighting. Because we are saying, look, the opposition was given a bed to win elections mm. when Zimbabwe was sanctioned. Zimbabwe was at war. And those factors should have made the opposition win in 2000. They even won the referendum. They were able to stop the Zimbabwean people voting for a new constitution because they won the referendum. But three months later, they failed to take majority in parliament where they lost by four seats. They got 57 seats. Zanopi have got 61 seats. That's a very good performance by the opposition, an opposition that had been formed six months before. Mm -hmm. But instead of them accepting defeat, they went to the world and said, we were beaten. We were victimized. And that's not what happened. Because then they wouldn't have won beaten. the... We saw photos no, 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 of no. the guy Murt. That was later. Oh. So here they were not beaten. And... Don't you guys rig elections in Zim? Hold on, hold on. Sorry, so, they, sorry. so here they were not beaten. They lost fairly because they won the referendum because they had a free reign to go and tell people what they wanted. Yeah. But they didn't put enough effort into making sure that this new political party gets those extra four seats. So they lost. And they lost because some people wanted the land that was being promised by ZANU-PF. Instead of accepting defeat, they go to the West and say, we're beaten. The West puts more sanctions. You see? Now. But that makes sense, right? Now there is this. No, it doesn't. From a Western perspective. If their agenda is to say, we want to go back to how things were, the West would intervene. Absolutely. But they're they're intervening illegally. That's point number one. Then point number two, the opposition are lying. This is what now creates the war scenario of adversarial relationships between the ZANU-PF ruling party and the opposition. Because then the opposition are now seen as enemies of Zimbabwe, utilizing economic weapons and utilizing superpowers in Western countries, our former imperialists, to attack a sitting government and the ruling party. Mm. But now, what many people don't say is that, so we get to 2000, they get these elect- sanctions, they lose, they get more sanctions to make sure that when we have presidential elections, which were being held differently from the uh, parliamentary elections, they hope that Mugabe would lose in 2000 and two. Two years later, we have presidential elections. There's now Zidera sanctions imposed on the Zimbabwean people. These Zidera sanctions stop the Zimbabwean government from getting any loans whatsoever from multilateral institutions, getting getting debt cancellation, and getting any assistance or even technical assistance from the IMF World Bank. So they think Mugabe is going to lose. Mugabe wins again. Why? Because people want land. It's because you guys rig elections. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. People want land. So now this time, the West then say to Tabombek, we want this guy gone. So we want to invade from South Africa. Tabombek refuses. What this means is that every Zimbabwean is now well aware that when you go and report to Zimbabwean issues outside Zimbabwe, to the British, to the Americans, they're not only just going to listen to you, they're going to want to sanction. Mm. And after they sanction, if, they don't, if you don't take power, they're going to want to invade. This is now clear to every Zimbabwean. But people still go and do the same thing. Hence, now you see when Tabombeki refused for, Zam- for, for the British to attack from South Africa, when the opposition lose another election now in 2008, 
go to Zambia. They go to Zambia. And remember, in 2008, there was violence. Many people say that this violence was instigated by the government of Zimbabwe. No. The violence you saw in Zimbabwe is no different from the violence you see between politicians in South Africa, where one group of politi- one group of uh, 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 supporters are looking at another group and saying, you are using economic weapons to kill me, to separate my family, to make me suffer, to kill the hospitals, so that you force me to elect your leaders. That's violence. There's, there's extreme political violence, especially in KZN, where even people within the same party kill each other for seats and people kill each other for tenders. So but that, it, that, that is a real thing. But at least you guys can see the war where they use guns versus guns. Mm. The Zimbabwean situation was one group of people was using a sophisticated group of weapons where I kill your family by starvation. Correct. I kill your family by not getting jobs. I force you to lose your wife because you can't provide for your wife because I've destroyed your job. But it's not violence per se, so Correct. people can see it. But then ZANU-PF members started being politicized to understand that no it's a form of violence they're killing we've you got, we've got you on your they're knees destroying you're, gonna, you. you're gonna beg you're, <laughs> you're gonna, gonna say beg. sorry and so they began to use the only form of violence they knew which is physical violence yeah. when they use physical violence the physical violence was portrayed as barbarism of these guys but they could not also show the violence that it killed 5,000 people from cholera because of the sanctions that it killed people from suicides because of an economy that had been depressed by these smarter guys who have got a smarter form of weapons that's what caused the violence you saw in 2000 can I say something controversial yeah um I want to start with what you're speaking about. The I think it was the Guptas. I don't know if it was Tuzane Zuma, but I think I heard the Guptas at some point where when their accounts were being frozen back in the day, when things were going sideways, part of the arguments were, forget us. We're comfortable. We're well off. We're connected. There are thousands of families that rely on our businesses and the way we operate. And if it's not going to be us, because I remember there was a time when they were even looking to hand over the businesses and say, fight us, let us hand over the businesses so people can keep eating. Because right now you're hitting us to our knees for us to behave. You speak about sophisticated violence and people will know about biological warfare where people are getting sick randomly. And now we're being forced to take jabs. We don't understand what weird side effects. The controversial thing I'm going to say is this becomes a teachable moment for the ordinary person to understand that there's a lot of violence between men and women. Women use sophisticated violence, mostly in the form of emotional abuse, verbal abuse. You will not see your kids. I slept with your brother. You know, you have a small dick. I hate you. Your mom is a bitch, whatever. And then men, unfortunately, become ZANU-PF. And the only violence they know is physical. And when that happens, he hit me, gender-based violence, and the NGOs come through. And this becomes now a conflict where we're meant to be working together. And when we speak about it, you're not allowed to speak about the other forms of violence. I just found out now that three of my kids are not my own. I just found out now she's been sleeping with my brother. I just found out now that she intentionally infected me with HIV because she was punishing me for and. Yes, I slapped her or I punched her. And I'm not saying it's fine, but no one wants to speak about what caused this because it it serves a certain agenda. And just like politically, it serves certain NGOs to come through and break our families apart and have women say, your men are beating you. And today you've got other people on the other side telling men, you see these women, these, these feminists and that they make so that we hate them and they hate us. I just wanted to raise that part that in terms of sophisticated violence, Besides a political perspective and an economic, we need to also just bring it back home and be like, for women in particular, good women at least, need to reflect and be like, guys, maybe we are also violent to these men and we don't realize it. Because if you've been with this guy for five years and it's the first time he's slapping you, what changed? But Did you say something? Did you do something? Did you deny him access? Did you, because clearly you, you hit him first, just not physically. And, and, then you and, and she could have hit you physically as well. Correct. She, she can punch you and then go and uh, uh, rep- uh, and you hit her back Correct. and she report. However... Sorry, I just pro- wanted to make that but, point. Uh, but the, 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 the example you give there is a perfect example because it, it, is, it is symptomatic of the problem in Zimbabwe. Mm. Men, Even in South Africa. Men are suffering in South Africa because you have sat on the sidelines. When you meet this sophisticated violence and you've done nothing about making awareness about it and making legislation against it, 
Right now, every South African man knows about Mavuso. You go, you sleep with a woman today, tomorrow morning, if you don't give her what she wants, she can tell you that I want 20000 I want $20,000. I mean, rand. And if you can't give her, she's going to open a case. And you get to a police station and every policeman behind that counter understands what could be happening to you. And they don't do anything about I, it. I saw a joke. Well, it was a joke <laughs> on Twitter where this guy was like, I asked this woman if uh, 20, but hold on, 20 hold on, hold on. But hold on. I, I, need, sure. I need to make this point. Ah, but I wanted so, to add so, the joke. So uh, you will add the joke. Will so, it still be relevant? Yes. Okay, so okay. you guys know this is happening. No, the, no, the you're police, making a big point. No, the, no, the, you're making a big point. I want to say this. So I saw this joke. <laughs> so this joke says, uh, this guy is like to a chick, I'm going to give you 20 rand. Is it enough for you to get home? She's like, I don't know, but it's enough for me to get to the police station. She's sorry. <laughs> please continue. <laughs> That's where we are. Look, we right. laugh about it because yeah. you have to laugh through the pain. It's If you're not going to give me this amount of money, the money you're giving me can only get me as 100%. far as the police station. So, But if you give me a certain amount of money, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, going to get home comfortably yeah. and <laughs> be like, thank you for last night. So we all know that that's what's happening. Yeah, and a lot we, of the we, police, we all, unfortunately, do the know. The police they know can't it. Do anything. The prosecutors know it. But men have not done anything to pressure their MPs to make legislation to fix that situation and to make this position recognizable in law and punishable in law. Some of the MPs when are Jacob's, also under the same pressure. By when the Jacob way. Zuma went to court after Tabombe created circumstances, and, and this is what pisses me off. He comes across as a righteous old little man. He's an evil hey, well, little man. You don't like Tabo? Of course I don't like Tabo. He's the one who created the scourge we have of sex being weaponized against men. Tabombek is responsible for that because he tried to do it to Jacob Zuma, made it acceptable. But we did not then do anything when this woman was proved to be a liar in court. We did not make legislation and laws and men sat behind, sat by and didn't create laws. You're going to get cancelled, bro. So Zimbabwe did, did the same thing. But you're going to get cancelled for what you're saying. The, I've always been cancelled. No, I know. But I just, you know, officially, officially on behalf of, let me come in here. My apologies. Uh, the Jacob Zuma trial with, I think her name was Ukwezi, which yes. is not her real name, was was very popular in the country. Jacob Zuma was accused of rape. He ended up not being found guilty. The lady went into hiding, etc. And very polarizing case, uh, understandably so. And we just want to say, look, we're not saying all women who open rape cases are weaponizing sex. And 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 uh, we're speaking in an isolated case because this is what I'm saying about you being cancelled because a lot of women are going to say, oh, Rotendo believes when we open cases, we are weaponizing. And you're like, no, 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 no. We're speaking about a specific case. You and know, Rotendo you know, is saying that he believes with Tabo Mbegi was one of the people behind the smear. We call it smear campaign of, you, of Jacob. You know what's happening now? Is that conversation where men hear women talk about how men are, are evil and they're killers and uh, men are what? Men are, men are, men are, what's that saying? Trash. Men are trash. Men are trash. And when we men who don't do that, when we men who don't do it complain, they say, oh, don't worry about you. If you don't abuse women, this shouldn't affect you. Correct. In the same way, women who do not weaponize rape, women who report pure, proper rape cases, um, 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 I shouldn't have a problem with um, the Fair issue enough. that we're discussing right now. So um, Zimbabwe made the same mistake as the men of South Africa are doing. So they knew, the Zimbabwean government knew that sanctions were being weaponized and used against them, illegally so, against the UN Charter, against uh, uh, UN Human Rights Council, uh, what you call it. They knew that these were the problems that were there but they did nothing about it. They did not take this issue to the United Nations. They did not take this issue to SADC. The Zimbabwean government did nothing to try and conscientize SADC members, South Africa, about this crisis that was there. So SADC accepted the opposition that was utilizing sanctions, persecution of civilians, to force those civilians to vote for them. That's a crime against humanity. Do you, do you think... The Zimbabwean oh, 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 government at the seconds, time, do you seconds. think they understood what was happening? It's there in law. No, I'm saying did they, at the time when it was still, when it was the sanctioning, do you think they were fully aware or it, on, it only clicked later? It, 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 it clicked when we came in. We're the ones that brought the argument. But my question is, Zimbabwe is made up of lawyers. 
Lawyers, the current president was part and parcel of the Zimbabwean government. He is a lawyer. Almost most of the top echelon of ZANU-PF are lawyers. How could they not have known that this was a crime? How could they not have known that this is a weaponized... Because even the Geneva Convention, which started being created in 1896, already said that in a war where nations are allowed to kill each other, people are allowed to kill each other, people are allowed to bomb each other and to shoot each other, they are not allowed to persecute civilians by denying them food, healthcare, factories that provide them with goods and services. You cannot bomb those targets, you cannot destroy those targets, and you cannot have embargoes and sanctions in warfare. So if they knew this from the Geneva Convention, which was amended again in 1940, 1947, what stopped them from knowing that what was happening to the Zimbabwean people was wrong and campaigning to SADC not to allow a opposition that continues to utilize the persecution of civilians to force them to vote for them from competing in Zimbabwean elections? Why did the Zimbabwean government right now, after we've made it clear what the opposition is doing, allow this opposition to partake in elections knowing that these opposition are using sanctions which were denounced as crimes against humanity to actually give them a chance at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. We've even got a study now by a professor called Professor Boisio Parks in New Jersey University in 2018, wrote a, a, a research paper in which he said that sanctions advantage uh, oppositions over incumbent governments. Makes he sense. even gives uh, a case study of MDC in Zimbabwe as having been given an advantage by sanctions. Mm -hmm. You even have a former deputy prime minister of Zimbabwe called Atam Tambara. In 2013, he goes to the World Economic Forum. He wants to ask the Americans to remove their sanctions and the Europeans. And he says, listen, sanctions were put to help me. Sanctions were put to assist me and Morgan Tsangirai. And now we are in power. We don't need the sanctions anymore. They are useless. That's an admission. So they know what's happening. But the Zimbabwean government has not gone out of its way to really make it clear to the international community, to SADC, and to the AU that we can no longer continue to have an opposition that utilizes the terrorism and the violence of economic persecution to force people to vote for them. So whose fault is it? It's the South African man's fault. You have not created legislation, laws, and awareness of the violence women perpetrate on men to cause a provocation that ends up leading to the chaos where men are said to be GB, uh, violating women. The Zimbabwean government has not done the same thing. It's precisely the same. Um, the, the first thing that comes to mind, because I like bringing a lot of these matters back home. People here speak about the DRC and Rwanda and America. They're like, hey, Baba, that's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> and it's like, it actually does. But let's try and bring it back home. In your opinion, do you think there are economic sanctions on, in particular, black Africans within racial groups on the ground? The same way you're speaking about the West and Zimbabwe and opposition parties. Do you think on the ground, the average black family, for example, is being disadvantaged by white Indian? And look, this is not to, dis to create discrimination and division. It's just to ask basic questions of maybe you guys are not aware of why you're poor and jobless and can't start businesses it's because there are groups. They're not the West. They're not America. They're not Europe. There are groups within your own neighborhoods who are manufacturing biases so that you do not, you're not able to farm in a certain town. <laughs> you're not able to set up a certain business. In that small little town, mm -hmm. the people that work at the normal bank, normal, they will not even process your application, they lie to you and say you are declined because there are small people in your town who are very well off, who manufacture these things and get you guys to fight each other just where you are kind of situation. Do you think Do you think we have Economic things like that? Yes, absolutely. On a, well, on a small scale. And and how would, how would we be able to identify them and how do we resolve them? I don't want to start at the small scale. I want to start at this big scale and then come through to the small okay. scale. So it starts with people who laugh at the ANC when the ANC says, listen, 
we are still fighting the legacy of apartheid and that's why we cannot deliver certain services as well as we can oh mamlindi wezulu and it's people very, say, oh, it's very triggering they, for they're us they're crazy they are mad no they're not mad when the apartheid system existed and created the infrastructure that all south africans brag about they created it by denying 90% of the south african people any services So all the money that was supposed to build RDP houses that would have swapped 10 million South Africans living in shacks today was being directed to making sure that white people in South Africa live the highest standard of living in this world among all white people. They were being given roads, they were being given freeways, they were being given the best schools. All that money was being put there, but also they were utilizing Africans as slave labor, so they didn't even have to pay the Africans the money they're supposed to be paid. That's why Umkuluako doesn't have a, a pension. That's why Umkuluako and Ugogoako can't look after themselves. They don't have pensions. They don't have health care, uh, 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 what you call them, uh, packages. What do you call it? Uh, health insurance. Sure. Well, and that's you what they have to, in America. And now it's become, medical aid here. it's become black tax. That black tax is money that the government was supposed to have set aside for your Goko and Kulu to live comfortably. They were supposed to have built proper houses like they did for white people, but they didn't because mm. they were busy putting it into making sure that white people have this wonderful infrastructure. That is Now, ANC has come in. They came into a country that was already 30 billion US dollars in debt. And they got into this country. It had coffers that were empty and they had to start building RDP houses, schools, roads in townships. I came into certain areas in Soweto that used to have dust roads. Those dust roads are not there anymore. Mm. But the ANC did not have the benefit of exploiting another group of people, 90% of the population, mm. not paying them, enslaving them, and then building for black people. Correct. They had to pay salaries, proper salaries. They created a minimum wage and the workers that are now building roads in townships today, that are building the schools today, have to be paid minimum wage. Mm. They cannot be slaves. They have to have a pension. They have to have a SASA, a, 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 a SASA at the end of their retirement. And they also have to have a UIF. This is why we like illegal foreigners, because you guys, we can exploit. <laughs> But please continue. And that's an interesting curveball that you've just put in. Especially so, rich white people in this country. They love illegal foreigners because it reminds them of uh, the good old days. So when you had black South Africans and you could exploit without labor laws. But now the problem is that the South African government didn't want to make, the ANC didn't want to make excuses. They just wanted to deliver. But they forgot that they're delivering on a base totally different to the base that the apartheid government had. And while they do trying to build, the apartheid companies that they left to exist, which control 80, 90% of the economy, they sabotage the ANC. Right now they're holding on to 380 billion rand that they're not putting into the economy, that they're not investing, that they used to invest during apartheid because the labor that they were getting and exploiting allowed them to make the highest profits in the world. These are and reserves the, that our biggest companies are just holding. They're holding. And not investing in the country. And the, those biggest companies are screwing the ANC the way that the Zimbabwean government was screwed by the by the British in the aspect that the ANC tacitly accepted not to ask for reparations, not to break these big companies, not to force them to return the property rights that they had from from apartheid on the basis that you help us grow this new South Africa. Mm. But these companies have screwed and reneged and come back against that deal. But it They sounds like you're protecting invested. the ANC. Because these same ANC guys, this is what we were speaking about, the proxies in Rwanda, DRC. These same ANC guys, these big companies with the reserves, some of those ANC guys sit on the boards. Don't, 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 don't mistake what I'm saying as excusing the ANC. Okay. The ANC has screwed all of us. Okay. Because these companies have destroyed companies in Zimbabwe. Okay. They have destroyed competitors in Zimbabwe because they had this largest from apartheid they were strong yeah we couldn't compete with them Cannot. they came in they killed our guys yeah. one the misinformation about zimbabwe is mostly driven by companies that belong to naspas south african media and naspas is a big giant that goes into zimbabwe to propagate anti-Zimbabwean sentiment because the ANC allowed NASPAS to continue to exist with its unjust enrichment from apartheid. We don't like it either. But I also understand the position that ANC is within the compromise and the raw deal that it made on its own. It also thought it can work with white people. They believed in this notion that we can have a multiracial society in which blacks and whites work together. And the ANC was out to prove that to the rest of Africa, that Africa, you failed because you failed to work with whites as one. 
Watch us they do it, did, boy. Watch us do it, boy. <laughs> and it's only now that the ANC is realizing, oh my God, these guys never loved us. These guys never cared about us. Even now, they even they even threatening to sacrifice Cyril Ramaphosa Wakona, take him to court if necessary. If the DA were to come, I wouldn't be surprised they'll take him to court for Palapala. The, the very same whites are now starting to question decisions being made by the public protector about Cyril. They, it's because they never cared about these guys. Fuckers never loved us. That's but, a trick. But that's what I love. The ANC is now very sure that they are not loved by these people. They even know that the most loved black man after Mandela, which is Cyril Ramaphosa, by the way, they're also realizing that they never loved Cyril. And probably when we look back, they never loved Mandela. And now they're realizing that. And for me, once a political party and the people get to that realization, they're capable of anything. Because Robert Mugabe came from also thinking, Tabon Beki says it, that we learned reconciliation from Zimbabwe and Robert Mugabe and how he accepted the whites. Then the whites sabotaged them. They assisted the party government in fighting wars against Zimbabwe. Then all of a sudden, Robert Mugabe realized these are not our friends. He turned. We are getting to a point where the ANC is capable of turning. Whether they're going to turn, I don't know. But they are capable of turning because now they realize that this is not my daddy. This is not my, 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 my step uncle. These motherfuckers hate us. For how long do black people keep blaming whites, apartheid and the West and don't take accountability? And uh, I'm going back to, I, I like the little, you like the big. Going back to small things like buying from a black owned business, working for a black owned business, making sure that you support the type of leaders who aren't just dancing and singing and saying the right things, but people that are actually doing work on the ground. How long, for how long will black people keep saying it's them and not us? versus it's it's us so let us solve it's what we were saying about men yeah the women are doing it's like okay let's let's get organized and let's resolve this thing it's going to be very difficult because what has happened is we live in a world of efficiency and cheapness you've got to be efficient as a business and you've got to give me the best possible price for me to buy from you yeah. otherwise i can't survive and the black small businesses are not geared to ever be able to compete and be efficient because they don't have economies of scale, mm. they don't have a market, and they're always going to be lagging behind because the owner can't get financing from the bank to compete with the white business. So the white business is always going to be more efficient, it's always going to be better, unless we have restitution. Mm. Which is why the Jews knew that they were going to face the same situation in a world of Germans, in a world of Europeans who had benefited from uh, the very same Holocaust that they suffered. They asked for reparations first. Wasn't that Level what PEE was meant to be? An affirmative action? Level, no, it was never meant to be that. That's the unfortunate part. But that's how it was sold, right? It was sold as such. We're going to like, protect black interests. We're going to allow black people into the mainstream economy. I'll tell you why it's different from reparations. In Europe, they say that part of reparation law is reparations can't be money. Reparations has to be goods, services, machinery, technology. So you break up a factory of a person who took advantage of you and you transport that entire factory from Germany to England and let England manufacture what German was, was manufacturing, even take the employees and people and skills to England, let them manufacture, now we export the very same thing to Germany. Let Germany produce grain and give us that grain. And we say that you owe us, like for instance, Germany I think was owing close to $2.2 trillion today, which was $198 billion, uh, then. Um, and they had to pay it off. They had to give over their companies. That's why right now a lot of German companies are controlled by Americans and the British. See, now, if you want to put black people in South Africa in the position they should have been, they should have been given tangible things, tractors, training. Mm. They should have been given uh, factories. By who? by the people who had robbed them and wronged them and perpetuated a crime against humanity Those people upon them. have never believed that they were wrong. That's why they'll never give you that. We don't need to make them believe. They need to be forced That's into what I'm doing saying the about right accountability. thing. <laughs> like you can blame, you're trying to blame an employer for underpaying you and exploiting your labor. And he's never said sorry. He's never said he's wrong. And I'm saying, for how long are black people going to blame versus being like, actually, we're the ones that... Yeah, no, there, there shouldn't be a conversation. Mm. The black people should have simply read the riot act. We hear now, and, like, and, for and, how and, long must Abo Lindi Wezulu keep saying it was apartheid verse, and we support her. She's right. So, so, versus so, saying so, no, so, let's actually... So, so what you're asking me is, what should be done? 
Correct. Like we said to the, gen- to the issue about the men and the issue about Zimbabwean sanctions, the very first thing that needs to be done to end white arrogance is that black people must now start getting military training. Okay? Black people need to know how to use firearms. Black people need to know how to defend themselves against the armed militia, uh, white militia that is roaming around in South Africa wild. You saw the EFF guy getting beaten up by a guy who had a gun, and he didn't have a gun. That has to end. That's a snapshot of what happened with colonization. <laughs> right he has now. a gun. I don't have, oh, He beat me because he has a gun. Mm. Baba. But, this but, can't be the same excuse that your the forefathers ANC, were using. And the ANC has allowed... The, They've, they've surrounded their black people with armed uh, settlers, exactly putting us to it. At least Boshaga had spears and they had their own weapons to Gatina, fight. We don't even have a Nopkiri. We have nothing. We don't even have a Nopkiri. Nothing. nothing. So that is the very first step that black people have to be empowered to defend themselves. The hardcore, when we speak about violence, you're speaking, we don't even have the most raw form no, of violence. No, raw form of the, violence. The guns and the what what. Because I was going to add the other things, Witty. People also need to learn the, the smarter forms of, mm. which is economic. Economic, yeah. And I've said this before when I was pushing by, by black. I'm like, when are we going to sanction ourselves and say, if this is not manufactured by my brother, sister, I will not buy it. Yeah. I would rather go hungry. And that person that's saying, look, you can have this. We'll give it to you for free. You're like, no, it's, it's, it's not halal. But do you know Therefore, what, but, 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 but do you know where the scary part is? You are you guys are getting close to a position where next year you might have a DA government. And once a DA government comes in, they're going to fire. And the, the guys who fill the SAPS from, from Limpopo, mm. they're going to fire those guys. Because they're they are they are they are incompetent. Mm. Then they're gonna put coloreds. They're gonna put Zimbabweans. Labas Zimbabweans that you see in the security companies, the the, the armed response. But so far, into the into the into the police. Are you saying private security has got foreigners? Oh yes, lots of them. This is my Zimbabwean brothers. But Which is like a private army, if you were to look at it. From and do you, and do you think it was it was it was it was a mistake? No, it's not a mistake. This Dudula, they said Dudula must rise and say, hey, Asbafuna, I'm a, I'm a query, query, what, what, what? The query, query are going to be your private security companies. And if you've looked, have you seen that the private security companies, now you get to a roadblock, you can actually find secu- private security companies there. They are slowly becoming to police the, the people. They are being caught in action against criminals more than ever before. Those are the people that are going to be used now when Dudula is starting to try to undertake protests. It'll be the security companies that will be there to meet them on the way. Who are the security companies? There's Zimbabweans in there. If you look at the bouncers that they're putting in the clubs nowadays, it's Congolese. It's Nigerians. Mm, it's it's deliberate. Yeah, it's been Nigerians. Bro. So, Tina, mind you, we are divided. We think there's a difference between us. Hey, laba makwere kwere. Bazo police la makwere kwere. And then what? They're going to be the riot police against you in a DA government. And the hatred that you've built over time, about Dudula and so forth, they're going to be using the same people against you. Mm. And we're saying to Abantbe Miyama, wise up. Because let's say the DA takes over. Let's say the DA starts to reinstitute apartheid, changing the police, changing the military. Guess who's going to stand up against the DA and fight the DA? It's the other Africans because you don't have the power to fight this DA system. We, we do. And we've been preparing for this moment all the way to today. Neighboring countries are not sleeping. I want to go back to the semicolon we put because you were speaking about uh, (laughs) medical helicopters that are meant to help uh, the healthcare system. Um, Thank you for sitting with uh, Ike, man. Um, People are hungry. Yeah. Uh, Africans are hungry uh, for the type of, we called it a debate. In retrospect, it wasn't a debate. It was a discussion. Discussion. People are very hungry for those type of debates. And look, obviously people pick sides. South Africans were favoring Ike. People attacked me. They said, you're giving your boy Rotendo too much time. Our Rotendo is being uh, unnecessary. We don't want to hear about history, by once. But I, I just want to say thank you. And you and Ike, thank you so much. We need to sit again. And maybe I'm going to use this opportunity to challenge Malawians, Mozambicans, those specific and then Nigerians and Ghanaian and maybe Congolese to please reach out to me um, so that we can have these conversations. Don't hide in the shadows. I met an amazing Nigerian man in Houghton 
And he was telling me some of the issues he has with Nigerians and how they make some of them look bad when they... I'm like, we need to sit and have these conversations because everyone catches heat when we don't speak out. Rutendo's yeah. spoken out. And what yeah. happens with leadership is you're asking to be attacked. Mm. You're like, I've put my hand up. When I ask other Zimbabweans, come speak. They're like, hey. Just scared, no, yeah. you're like, okay, you, you're going to attack Rutendo, but you're clearly not willing to mm. speak. And you say mm. he's wrong. Mm. Who must speak? Because mm. I'm not going to do it. Mm. I'm not a Zimbabwean. Mm. I'm not going to go and say Rutendo's lying. I was in Zim. And you must come and say Rutendo's lying and explain why. And I'm going to ask you and then sit down. Are you like Rutendo? Are you looking for what's best for the Zimbabwean people? Because maybe you've been, you've just been a sucker of propaganda. I and I disagree with Rutendo a lot on many things. I think he's naive about a lot of things. I think some of the things he says sound like funded propaganda. That's my opinion. But mm -hmm. we need to have the platform to chat. To chat. Come and speak and as a Nigerian, and as a Congolese, et cetera. So, so thank you for that sit down. And I, I hope more and more people will check it out. And we need to have more of them, importantly. I went to visit Russia. Uh, I was at St. Petersburg for the Russia-Africa Economic and Humanitarian Forum. I went to visit China. I was going to go see my kids, but it's always nice being in China because because of the type of people we are, wherever we are, we are always paying attention and asking questions and learning. And learning. Um, West African coups, uh, Gabon, Burkina Faso, uh, Chad, Mali. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm forgetting anyone there so i don't know if it's called the wagner group from russia and now we're speaking about zim nangagwa getting nice elections you know <laughs> oh, yeah, the and, jets, and you're yeah. speaking about sadic countries and maybe other african countries that are currently arming themselves while ordinary south africans black in particular are not even thinking of getting a knife what do you think, I don't know if you've studied, what do you think has led to the coups in West Africa from your perspective? And do you believe that Russia is helping arm African nations to defend themselves, maybe for sovereignty? Russia's probably doing it for their own agendas. We've got a half gap now to take over from America. And if Russia comes in, because I don't know if China funds military, but Russia looks like they're comfortable to be like, we'll give you whatever you need. And we've got a mate, China, so we'll give you the guns. And then you guys need a little bit of money. We've got a nice Chinese mate. That side, he can borrow you some money because clearly the West are sleeping. They forced their military. You can have your military. We are just going to give you the guns. Mm. And then these guys will give you the money. And not only the money, they will actually even come and build the entire thing for you. The harbor or the airport or the whatever infrastructure. What, what do you think has led to the Western coups? And, and what are your thoughts around Russia, China, BRICS and their... their plan and, and vision and their work on the African continent? You asked some tricky questions there. Um, the perception that has been created is that the coups in West Africa right now are being um, are being engineered by the Russians yeah. to remove puppets of the West. That is the information we're being given. Correct. But do we have enough information to make a decision on that? I don't think so. And I bring this issue to you right now because there was an Ipsos report that just came out recently on misperceptions and they said that the country with the worst misperception in the world is South Africa and misperception is basically delusion so South Africans are the most delusional people who don't know the difference between facts and fiction because whenever they were asked questions murder in Africa murder in South Africa uh, immigration crime they always gave an answer closer to fiction more than the fact and this is the thing that I'm also seeing our perceptions being molded around what's happening in West Africa is because of the media that is around us that's feeding us information. So South Africans have got a perception issue because they've got a, a, a media that is lies, a media that gives false information, a media that is so biased and doesn't give South Africans balance that they cannot know the truth. That is a danger. And we are all in South Africa right now being told how to perceive what's happening in West Africa based from the lenses of Western media, South African media, and social media influenced by these medias. So I don't really know. But the narrative that is being given is that the Russians, the Chinese are the ones that are funding these guys. But I find it difficult to believe because look at all these French colonies, the guys that turn up and, and, and upset their governments. They are French legionnaires, and a lot of them are also trained by the Americans in the current time 
on how it is that they're supposed to uh, learn to fight. It becomes very difficult to believe that that just could be the Russian influence when these soldiers were trained by the Americans. Do you In think Niger, they were trained by the Americans. On Niger's another. Do you think there's a chance that uh, sleight of hand and uh, misdirection? I don't know if I'd accuse America, but maybe someone is upset, or, or, or France upset someone, and they're like, "We we want to punish France." And maybe gain power, but we're going to make it seem as if it's certain people. But it's because maybe there's something that France is doing that we don't like. Now you're bringing up the issues that it could actually be the Americans behind the scenes trying to topple France's control of its former colonies. That's a possibility. Mm. And then it's blamed on the Russians, yet the Americans are behind it all the time. Which is why you saw the head of AFRICOM, the one who came to Zambia to give speeches about the helicopters. He was brought in front of Congress and he was being asked. How many countries that you are training the soldiers have coups happened? They were the ones that were behind the coup in Guinea. They were the ones that were behind the the yes, the coup in Mali. You understand the coup in uh, so 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 the American hand is there. Sorry, what is a coup for a person that doesn't know? And uh, and are the coups only happening with French colonies? Just for people to have clarity. Yes. Most of them are happening with French colonies, and it's not a new phenomenon. What, a, what is a coup? Coup, coup d'etat? It's, it's, it's a removal of a democratically elected leader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I put it in quotation marks because, but it's basically the removal of somebody who was elected by the ballot, and then they're being removed by their military. Okay. Yeah. So, so if I organize a group of guys to take over the ANC government in whatever way, that's not a coup. It has to be the army. It has to be our army that does it, or it has to be some type of army? If you remove a government um, by an army, okay. if you remove it by force, if you remove it by protests, mm. and if you remove it even um, through a democratic process, but through parliament, all those have been referred to as coups. Okay. Anytime you usurp power without utilizing the ballot, it's considered as a coup. And, or, and or, a lot yeah. of these countries that are currently dealing with this are countries that are, are rich in minerals, in particular uranium. And most people are not aware that the bulk of French power, we spoke about the DRC and the Inga Dam, in France the bulk of their power is nuclear energy, yes. which is a very controversial topic in yeah. South Africa. Mm. Um, and if France is not getting its uranium from its former colonies, yeah. which last I check still pay tax mm -hmm. <laughs> to France, then France doesn't have power. Yeah. And now we speak again about economic sabotage and, and of which we don't know if it's sabotage, it might just be France, like the West, because I'd like to think, I don't know if we'll get to speak about Reddy and Chris. I listen to them, or I listen to Reddy, and I, I, maybe it's because I'm a clever black, I agreed with 80% of what you're saying. There's a huge arrogance from an American perspective. Maybe France also got too comfortable, got too arrogant. And a Julius Malima, and the EFF and people are like, but we want land, we want this. The guys are not coming to renegotiate. It's like, we've got our guys there, it's chilled. It's like, okay, since you guys don't wanna to listen to us and you're arrogant, we'll show you. Yeah. And until France humbles itself and says, sorry, we, we know there's military coups, we'd like to sit. Clearly you guys are upset. And as long as they're arrogant, things won't change. But you need to understand, I want to bring you to understand the French scenario by making you understand what happened in the last Zimbabwean elections. So what happened in the last Zimbabwean elections is the opposition did not really campaign that much. They campaigned here and there, but they had no real strategy. In fact, they used something that was called strategic ambiguity. That's what they actually called their strategy. We're not going to tell you what's happening and you're not, you're going to keep guessing. And then we're just going to surprise you at the end. It became clear what the strategic ambiguity strategy was. The Americans had a team in Turkey and they had a team in Kenya. And these guys were utilizing computers to hack into our central election system of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. So what happens in Zimbabwe is that when an election happens, we've got about 12,300 and something polling stations. At those polling stations, you poll, I mean, you have observers, you've got the media, you've got um, agents of the political parties, all of them, they sit in and early in the morning before we even start having the polls running, 
we have an inspection of the poll. We inspect the polling station, the ballot box comes in, we open the ballot box, we look in, to make sure that it has not uh, filled with anything. We look at the pens, we look at the ink, we look at the ballot paper. When all these parties, observers, party, party agents are happy, media, and the election officials. And remember, those election officials you see there, not all of them are ZANU PF supporters. Many of them are opposition members. The police in there, many of them are opposition members. Everybody agrees that we're happy. The ballot starts. The observers are taking notes. The agents are taking notes. At any point in that election, when you're not happy with what you're seeing, you ask for the election to stop or you start complaining. When the election is finished, there is a consensus. Was the election free, fair? Are you happy with what you saw? These guys say yes. Then they take the ballots, empty them out, count them at the ballot station. Immediately once the counting is done, we have to accept these are spoiled ballots. That's a ballot for this party. That's a ballot for this party. When there's consensus that we've counted correctly, they then take a form that's called a V11, and then they put in the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then the signatures of all the party agents who are there go in there, and that paper is taken and put outside the polling station for the public to take pictures. For the it's, it's similar to our process where now, all the party representatives have to. Now those then, those V11s are then put into a ballot box and shipped over to the central uh, counting station. That, those V11s are then entered into a computer system so that at the end of the day, a computer can tally these numbers for them to be announced after the period where announcements are supposed to be done. The Americans had come up with a smart idea. The hackers who were in Turkey and the hackers that were in Kenya and some hackers that were in Zimbabwe were supposed to hack into the uh, system that when the V11s are being entered into the system, they're shifting and changing the numbers. Once that's done, when the day of announcing the results, the people at ZEC won't have time to get a tally, a physical tally of all the V11s to then give them a number. They have to announce what's on the computer. Mm -hmm. And once they had announced what's on the computer, based on the media allegations that are already being made, oh, Zano PF is cheating, Zano PF is rigging, Zano PF is doing this, the number that's announced there would be the number that's accepted. So that even when a physical tally is made of the V11s and Zano PF actually realizes that the result could have been different, when they try to go to the media and give this information, no one would listen to it. So the Russians and the Chinese have a vested interest in Zimbabwe. China has built the biggest steel plant in Africa in Zimbabwe. Russia has got very big concessions for 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 for, for chrome and uh, uh, lithium and uh, platinum group metals. Did China and, build this for Zimbabwe for themselves? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a joint venture between the Zimbabwean government and the Chinese government. Okay. So this steel that's going to be coming from this plant is going to drive um, construction uh, 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 and industry in Africa for China. So they're not going to export it back to China. The steel is actually going to be used here on the okay. African continent. So they gave information through our central organizations had this information that there's going to be a hacking job that's going to be done. So they closed the American hackers out of the system without the American hackers realizing that they had been caught out. And what was supposed to happen is while the hackers were doing their job, there were also people internally who were supposed to be on social media giving results. Mm, in real time. From the digital, not the, the physical. Yeah. But Zanopia fortunately was ahead of the curve. And that's how we were able to have the results that we got because the Americans were rigging. And that's why Nelson Chamisa was so sure that he was going to win the elections. And that's also why they had put the American military in Zambia, so that once the results are announced from the digital, if Zano PF then contested with the physical count of the V-11s, that army was ready to come in to force the Zimbabwean army to accept Nelson Chamisa or for the, over, for, for the, for the Zano PF government to be removed forcefully. Mm -hmm. So by the time we began to announce this information, and give information about, I actually wrote an article about this rigging process and this hacking system that had been set up and how the hackers eventually be caught in Harare and Kenya. And then the ones that were in Turkey ended up being able to get away because they didn't get information. Into, I mean, they were not caught in time. The Americans and the Zambians got upset. Hence, they got the protest to start happening to put attention on me. But in reality, what they were pissed off is this exposure of what it is that they've been doing behind the scenes. 
Do you understand why you sound like a Zanu PF defender? Absolutely. I do. And you don't but, mind. But now I want to give you the scenario yeah. that links with the with with West West Africa. So let's say Chamisa had succeeded because this is how Hechilema of Zambia got into power. They rigged him into power and defeated Edgar Lungu. But right now he's struggling with his own people that want him gone. That is why now he's become draconian. He's arresting people, putting them in jail. And he actually warned coup plotters in Zambia who might want to plot a coup. And this was in the, in the BBC. Mm. If Chamisa had gotten into power in a country where he actually, his party does not have over 35% of the vote, what do you think the army would do? What do you think the people of Zimbabwe would do? If the Americans forced our government to accept him, he would probably be able to run the country for one week, two months, three months. But he's got a whole bureaucracy of civil servants who didn't support him under him or who don't like the fact that he was forced on the country. How will he govern the country when these people can sabotage him? Eventually, you would see a coup happening in Zimbabwe from the very same army or the police because the Americans could never come and take away the whole entire bureaucracy of the of of, of, of uh, Zanu PF that had been put in Zimbabwe to make sure that they've got one for Chamisa. But this is this sounds like jail because I look at the ANC as an example, and if ever elections were free and fair, and the and the ANC was overthrown, wouldn't we imp- be imprisoned by the same bureaucracy? where there are so many ANC people that are sitting at so many places that whether it's a DA or EFF government, they can't actually do anything. So then you're almost asking us just accept what is because whoever comes in is going to struggle. Well, part and parcel of why you see the municipalities, DA has gone into municipalities, is failing this minute. Yeah. It's because of what you're talking about. It might but, be sabotage from the ANC. But. Might be. Might be. But there's a very big difference when you talk white people and black people. Mm. White people have capacity. White people have international solidarity. So the DA has not shown you its hand in its municipalities because it deliberately wants to wait for it to get national power before it shows you how it deals with this sabotage. The DA and its white solidarity with its white friends all across the world can replace the entire system overnight Mm. with white solidarity. They can get technocrats and people from all across the world to come and sit in a government and then start training them on how they can run the system Mm. like they used to run the apartheid system. And that's what I believe they're going to do. Who do you think is going to win the South African elections next year? And uh, I know you and I off camera had spoken about (laughs) the EFF potentially working with the DA, of which the DA has openly said the EFF is enemy number one, more than the ANC. Ah, that's just a ruse. They're fighting this war by deception. They're smart. The DA, EFF are, are playing a smart game. Right. A reason why I say that the EFF is going to vote with the DA is Floyd Shivambo says it on his own in an interview that he did with Cizu and Bof. He Dr. clearly Cizu and Bof Walsh. Floyd Shivambu, yes. is he the deputy president Pre- of, deputy president of, the, of EFF? the EFF? And he said clearly. He said we're willing to work with the DA. He says the ideal scenario is for us to totally dislodge the ANC as the opposition. We come together, we unite, and we totally dislodge the ANC. We remove the ambassadors, we remove their military generals, we remove the everybody, every remnants of them. We take it out by the roots and take them out, right? And then we put a new system in this in the system. Mm. Right now, when you listen to that, it sounds very sensible. But when you start to ask yourself, who is the opposition and what kind of system will they put in? You realize that EFF is what 6.8%, 6.6% in the national, uh, national, national thing. I don't know if they got close to 10 last time, but please carry on. Right. They are a minority and DA is 22%. They are the biggest opposition political party in South Africa. Not the EFF, even though the EFF tries to create the impression that they are that big. They're big on Twitter, boy. They're, They're big on, on Twitter. Twitter. Whenever I run polls, the but EFF wins all of them by but far. But it's the same thing. Like uh, Chamisa was big on polls, but in reality, he didn't have the support that he required. So but anyway. But the 2019 national election, uh, ANC got 62%. The DA got 22%. And uh, EFF? Sorry, 6. 6.6%. 6. 6.3. Yes. 6.3%. So they are a nothing party, all right, which plays big. So when they get into this coalition with the giant DA, 
They're going to be a junior player in this coalition of opposition parties that have decided that ANC has not gotten 50%. So let's all come together and remove the ANC. Mm -hmm. So they will be able to remove the ANC, but the DA will be calling the shots. Not only will they call the shots because they're a politically bigger party, but they've got more money, and the whole entire private sector system supports the DA. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that's correct. And EFF will be told in no uncertain terms, you've got no security, you've got no guns, you are nobodies. Where now Floyd and, the, and the Julius, there's VBS, there's on-point engineering, we can destroy you, of which I think they will destroy. So the DA will get to control power. But what happens when they control power? The difference between the DA and us black people is white people know how to use power. So what do they do first? They will remove judges that they think don't work for them. They'll put judges that will work for them and make right-wing decisions. So I want to correct. I made a mistake. I, don't, I think I was looking at the elections before. ANC got 57.5. The DA got 20.7. And the EFF got 10.8. Brilliant. I think the seats before uh, was the elections before 2019. Brilliant. Because I remember it being 10%, so I just needed to double check. But all the same. But I can be corrected as well. If I'm but still but all the same, thing. all the same, EFF is a junior player in this particular mm -hmm. scenario, right? So once the DA gets into power, they will put people in key things, which is what we black people don't understand, which Mugabe understood. You remove judges and put judges that are more palatable to your political policy. And you do it unapologetically. You make sure that you remove uh, people within the police uh, 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 leadership and the prosecuting authority system, and you put people unmeanable to you. You go to the army, you do the same. Once they have done that, they've got a system that can now enforce what they need. The unfortunate part is that they're always going to make decisions that are going to make the majority angry at mm. some point. And remember, they don't have a majority Mandate. Mandate. This is so, the DA. The DA. Yeah. So the majority are going to start uprising, but they are prepared for that because they've got a democratic mandate to run this country and they will utilize the words of insurgency, they will utilize words of insurrection and make sure that they use their police to deal with this. And they've got the support of the West because the West needs South Africa to align with the Western agenda. So unlike apartheid, if they use very draconian methods to control the masses, the Americans will say, it's fine. The same way they've accepted neo-Nazis in, in Ukraine, they will accept this government cracking down on black people. So black, will, black people don't realize that you will not get out of that system with a world that supports you. The world is going to turn away. The West is going to turn away because they need a friend in South Africa. They need a friend in Zambia to control SADC. Mm. I want, to see? I want to shut this conversation and down. So, and so this is where I say the EFF is very compromised because Floyd has said it in his own words. Those people who don't believe me must go and watch the interview. He has said it in his own words clearly and he reiterated it that the only problem we have is that the DA is arrogant. They don't want us there. And I'm saying no, those are just words, meaningless words. The DA and the EFF will surprise us as they've done in municipalities and they will end up coming together as long as they promise the EFF boys something. Mm. So if they say to Julius Malema, you'll be the deputy president, mm. he will sell out. And they have not said or ruled out that they would do a deal with the, with, 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 the, with the DA. They want a deal with the DA. The DA is the one playing hardball. Then they said, we will only do a deal with the ANC if they remove Cyril Ramaphosa. That's the EFF. That's the EFF. If they do not remove Cyril Ramaphosa, they can go to hell. So what does that mean? We'll go with the DA. So it's very likely that we'll see a DA government next year. That's what you're, that's what you're forecasting? You said who will win. I believe the ANC will win because its survival de depends on it. By when you mean over 50% of the votes? That's the only choice they've got. Get okay. over 50% so you don't deter, depend on the smaller Nyana guys. Mm. Because this this game, you remember how people have always alleged that Cyril Ramaphosa bought his way into the presidency. Yeah. If Cyril Ramaphosa can be alleged to have bought the way into the presidency, imagine what white monopoly capital is willing to do to ensure a coalition of opposition parties mm. against the ANC. They will, they will break the bank to do it. In fact, they don't need to break the bank. They've got so much money. It will, 
they can't break banks. They could tell easily each and every political leader and political party that will give you 10 million rand. You will never know poverty again. To vote with the DA. I want to. I want to close this conversation, but I want to close it with. So we didn't speak about U- Uredi and Uredi Klabi and Chris Maruleng. What's his surname? Maruleng. Something like that. Apparently, he's a the, South African born in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and then Zimbabwe. he was naturalized. He's a Zimbabwean whose permit was queried by a lady that one one of these ladies that got suspended uh, from Home Affairs. I'm just forgetting her name. Uleduaba. Uh, I, I, okay. I, I don't remember, but yeah, apparently, um, apparently his papers are dubious. But <laughs> just like just like uh, Peter Ndoro had dodgy papers as well, these people are assets of the CIA. Peter Ndoro, uh, of course. Did you vote They're, at the Zim elections? No. Ah, why I not? Can't, I can't vote in elections that are rigged. Rigged by who? By the opposition. The opposition is being assisted by sanctions every single year, hoping to give them power. I can't be participating in that. They must remove that opposition first, (laughs) bar them from elections like what they did with BLF in South Africa. Then there'll be legitimate elections. Because what happens is if the opposition is cheating with sanctions, you are forcing ZANU-PF to counter. If the opposition is using the Americans to rig our electoral system, what are you forcing ZANU-PF to do? We can't have that kind of scenario. Those are not elections. Whenever I bump into Zimbabweans, it's one of the questions I ask them, and almost all of them didn't go home to vote. And I ask, if you guys want things to change, whatever that means, and you're not going to be active in whatever way, I don't even know if you're serious. But how are you even going to vote in an election that is being rigged by outside players influencing what's happening inside? The South African media is lying. It tells stories from a one side. You see Hopewell every day on your TVs. You'll never see Hopewell me there. Chino, no. I've yeah. DM'd him and I hope one day I'll get to sit with him. So how, how do we have a situation where there is entire negative propaganda about Zimbabwe and you want Zimbabweans in South Africa to vote in a country that continues to have a biased media that lies? You want them to vote in England, where there's an England that, as a as a government, that also propagates negative propaganda on Zimbabweans. But you expect us to give the vote to people that you're continuously lying to every single day. Why would we do that? Right now, most people believe that Zimbabwe is the most violent society when it comes to elections. Yet South Africa has killings of three politicians every single month. Hmm. Um, Zimbabwe has never had the murder of any politician probably for the past forty years. You you always get triggered when we speak about apartheid. <laughs> and when black South Africans are like, hey, at least apartheid was better. We had jobs, etc., etc." My question is, um, do you think black leaders across the African continent have what it takes to run their own countries? Yep. Have black leaders proven that they have the ability to do it? And... This is beyond sabotage because sabotage will always be there. doesn't matter who you are. And in my opinion, and this is why I could never defend Andre De at, at ESCOM, even though a big chunk of white people were defending him. When you are put in a position, whatever the position is, to manage a country, to run a country, to manage a state utility, and you are going to say, but the issues that people are stealing and the, it is your responsibility to get rid of those people or to solve that problem. And if you're failing to do that, to defend your country against the West, maybe BRICS is becoming a problem, then maybe you're not the right person to be in charge there. Anglo Ashanti has left South Africa. They've delisted from the JSE, gone to the New York Stock Exchange. I believe Anglo-American is the biggest mafia to ever be in this country. And I believe they and subsidiaries that have come over time are actually the people that run South Africa and many African countries as well. And today they run it from America and other places. From what we've seen, do you really think black people have what it takes to run their neighborhoods, their towns, their cities, their provinces, their countries, uh, to a point where black Africans today are not liking democracy anymore? Some of them yearn for arguable authoritarian, uh, technocratic figures, Xi Jinping in China, Putin in Russia, where people are almost like, maybe we want apartheid back because for the things that actually matter to us, fuck representation, but to have food, to have institutions where we can learn real skills. Today, we have a black government where we don't know how to fix or to change a car tire, how to repair light uh, electricity issues, plumbing. 
Like, do you think black people actually have the power, bro, to actually run this thing properly, aggressively, and not report to business? Because this is one of the things I explain to people. China and Russia are the way they are because business doesn't dictate to government. Business comes underneath. Putin and she will decide who runs ESCOM. They, realistically, in South Africa, our politicians, all the way to Cyril as president, they have to go and ask business for money and for assistance and for a mandate. Well, the truth of the matter is that when people have this discussion, I always say, is South Africa better today uh, under ANC or is it better under apartheid? Were black people more comfortable under apartheid or the black uh, they comfortable more comfortable now? The answer is simple. No one would be able to live in the apartheid scenario for just a, a, a day in the current South Africa because you're so spoiled. You guys have had it so nice, so comfortable. None of you would be able to live under a DA government for a day. I can guarantee you that. You guys go where you want, whatever time you want. When I first got to South Africa in 1999, that is uh, how many years? Six years after I got an independence. I would come out, park my car, and there'll be two other cars. And the party is full, thousands of people inside. And most of those car people don't have cars. You don't see that anymore. A little young woman who hasn't done well at metric, she's passed, but she can't go to university, will work in a call center, earn enough money to get a car and to get a townhouse and to live a very comfortable middle class life. Mm. That wasn't the case during apartheid. Sure. I told you, we, I always use this as a joke, that we used to go to the township, driving cars, get to the township, and you use taxi two as a means to get chicks. And we used to get chicks. You can't Street get wise a, two, you can't, people that don't know. You can't get a woman on that anymore. Now, it might seem mundane, this, this, this example I'm giving you. It illustrates an, an escalation in the standard of living. You guys have got people, black people with businesses now, huge corporations. I was at a mine of a friend of mine recently, a South African boy, mm. who's been able to invest 60 million rand worth of equipment on his own mine that he paid 90 million rand to get the mine. Mm. And now he's done exploration and everything. That's a black boy built by this South Africa. And 7 million other people were taken out of poverty to live like that. Mm. Right? Now, People take that for granted. You've become so comfortable that you take where you are for granted. Mm. For me, that difference of black lives is the success of the ANC government. A success that is so much that black people are beginning to expect so much. They want to live like Americans now. You guys live better than some Americans that I've seen in bed -Stuy. You don't even realize that. that South crazy. Africans go to holiday to France, to Paris. They wear designer clothes. You are now worried about designer clothes because your, 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 your physiological needs and your lower needs are taken care of. Not for everybody, but for a, a greater majority. Mm. There's still people who are left behind who still need, be to, need to be taken up. But that now means that that black middle class of black South Africans that have these minds that have companies, that have music companies, they now need to start investing in producing the manufacturing and jobs that is going to be given to other black people. And the failure of that happening is not an ANC problem. It's a black South African problem. When people go and drink a million rand at Conca, instead of investing that in a factory, that's not an ANC problem. ANC has played its part. It's done more than enough. Mm. But the black South African has failed to turn a Lamborghini into a factory. This is the black middle back. class and the black new rich. And nobody's holding the black middle class of South Africa accountable, but you guys spend money more than any other Africans. Mm. You guys spend money. Mm. You guys buy very expensive cars. And it's not only here in Zimbabwe. My, my brothers are doing the same. Hence we say, shut up. Don't tell us about Zanopia failing. They gave you everybody in Zimbabwe can apply for a mining license. You can apply for land. You can rent land. You can farm. You can mine. You can start a business. You can start a factory. You can start brick making. You can even start making the little pebbles and stones that are put into tar and into, into foundations. Mm. If you're not doing that, if you haven't tried that, don't say Zanopia has failed. Say, I have failed. So that is the same with the black South African. And if the black South African has not invested in South Africa, but still hasn't invested in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and so forth, he can't complain. Because the whites, when they have their money, they invest in South Africa and they also spread their wings to other places and make more money.
Until we've done that and failed, we cannot say our governments have failed if they've given us the money in our hands, which is what you South Africans have, mm -hmm. and in Zimbabwe, the opportunity and uh, uh, factors of production that we have. Let's take advantage of those first, and then let's fail at that. Do you support the welfare state we're becoming? Almost half of the South African population is on one or other grant. We've seen a destruction of our skills uh, institutions under what, the ANC what, government, what, what, which what, what, I, I fully agree with you. And it's one of the things that's pained me for so long that the ANC seems to lack a propaganda machine to highlight the amazing things mm. that they've done. Um, the, the do you not think that may, may, maybe to your argument, the ANC did so well that whether it's them or other people are saying, this is looking too good, we can't have this. So start destroying the things that are gonna allow you guys to become really great. And let's rather move backwards and have greater poverty, fewer jobs. Let's have black people fighting amongst each other with especially their foreign brothers and sisters. And this is where we are now. And let's not, maybe let's not use apartheid as a benchmark, but let's say, can we borrow certain learnings from the apartheid government where they built infrastructure and maybe hold the black middle class accountable and say, copy how ESCOM, CESOL, ESCO were built and then do that here. And don't let the ANC, maybe they've played, maybe maybe they've run their race. Maybe it's now time for you guys to be like, okay, they did all these things and they taught our roads. We now have flushable toilets, etc. And guys, let's stop expecting so much from these people. Now it's time for us to be like, they educated us. We had NSFAS, we had free schooling, we live in the suburbs, we speak good English. You can't expect your grandfather to do everything and take you to Dubai. It's now up to you to build the factories, to rebuild the skills institutions too. You, you always hear people saying that um, 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 the ANC uh, has got so many... Ah, you always hear people saying South Africans are lazy. Mm. Foreigners, that is. And why they say that is because where you have so many people on welfare in that country, you'll have a guy who will enter that very same country today and he will put up a little box on the corner of a traffic light and start selling cigarettes. And before you know it, he's already got a spaza in two, three years' time. I am a Zimbabwean that doesn't want people to know where I live. But every time I need a plumber and a phone to look for a plumber, I get a Zimbabwean on the other side wanting to come and do my plumbing so that he, and I don't want that Zimbabwean to come to my house. I hunt for the South African. I even hunt for white South Africans and Indian South Africans. And they're almost difficult to get because it's a Zimbabwean who's going to come do my plumbing. It's a Zimbabwean who's going to come and do my electricity. When I want gas to be delivered to my house, it's a Zimbabwean who wants gas to, be, to, to deliver the gas to my house. Every service that I need to be done at my house where I don't have a Zimbabwean knowing where I live and how I live, it's being done by Zimbabweans. Plumbing, electricity, um, gas delivery, um, someone to fix my remote for the gate. It's a Zimbabwean who's coming. The security guards. You know, you and I used to share most of those security guards were from Zim. Now, the painter, Zim. All those opportunities that could have been taken up by South Africans who would not therefore need welfare. And most of those Zim guys who come and do the gas, mm -hmm. who come and give you your electricity, who come and uh, do your plumbing, who come and do your painting, they drive cars, they live comfortable lives. Whites, black South Africans should be living those lives. Now my question is, why are they missing those opportunities? Because I, we've had this discussion before, they think that they don't want to do those jobs. I want an office job. But the Zimbabwean guy is coming to do it. We need to change the mindset of the people, and that's where the ANC got it wrong. They did not social engineer the people to understand the roles they're supposed to play to build a nation. White apartheid South Africa knew its role. Mm. They knew that we're going to enslave the blacks, but while we're enslaving the blacks, we are enslaving them so that we can have the better jobs. But we have to work. We have to work. We have to work to build a nation. Zimbabweans can be complacent as well. You don't see them behave the way they behave here. It's because they can't survive if they don't work. But sometimes even at home, they don't want to work because my, co my cousin's going to send me money from the UK. My cousin's going to send me money from South Africa. They don't want to work some of the guys there. Mm. But yet there's land that they can farm. 
There's mining that they can do. There's mining services that they can supply the mines. There's construction that they can do. They can provide the stones for construction, provide the uh, cement for construction. They can be the construction company. There's so much to be done there, but they don't want to do the hard work. And I've said to you before, even I don't want to do the hard work. Mm. But we must accept when the things are not working because I don't want to do the work and where our government has failed. Where you don't want to do the government, the, the work, yet the work is there, you are the problem. And that's a problem we are seeing in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Mm. We have Nigerians coming to Zimbabwe. I'll tell you a story. So this Nigerian guy comes. He sees all these buildings that are full of uh, tenants and stuff. Then he goes and says, let me talk to the owners of the buildings. Goes to talk to the owners of buildings. A lot of them are white. He says, what are the problems you're seeing with your building? And this guy's saying, I, I struggle with my tenants paying the rent. Then this guy says, why don't you give me your building? How much do you make every month from your tenants? The guy will say, $32,000 every single month. He'll say, right, I'll give you thirty-eight. Give me the building. This guy says, what? You give me thirty-eight? He'll say, I'll give you thirty-eight every single month without a doubt. The white guy says, that's fine. The first thing that the Nigerian guy comes, he ends all the leases. Then he says, you're no longer going to have a whole floor to one company. I'm going to partition the building into little cubicles, little cubicles, little cubicles. Then he puts in his own people. Everybody is now paying a fraction of what the guys that used to be in there were paying for a small little space now. But everybody can afford to pay the rent. The guy gives the white guy his $38,000 and then he keeps $115,000 to himself. And he's become a multimillionaire in Zimbabwe. From having a different approach to uh, uh, leasing buildings. No more leasing 10 floors of buildings for one company. I don't want the big companies. I want small little individuals that just want a space to showcase their products to millions of people who come into town. They're teaching us that in Zim. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we were wasting the opportunity. We were wasting space. We were used to abundance. Didn't use the abundance to its fullest potential. Now, you can hate that Nigerian and say, ah, this Nigerian is taking our opportunity or we can learn from him. Correct. And that's what we need to do in Africa. I want to make two last points and then I'll let you finish. The first one is a foreigner mindset is something that I speak about in my belief system of paternalism, where I encourage people to travel and see how other things work elsewhere. And if not, spend time with foreigners within where you are. Listen to them, watch how they move because you learn from them without having traveled. If you if black South African, if you chose Zimbabweans, Mozambicans, Nigerians, watch how they work, they move, and try and borrow that mindset and pretend like you're also a foreigner. As a black South African with all the advantages and the ID and the access, you can become very powerful. The um, I forgot to get his name, sorry. The the leader of Singapore. I think his name Lee, is Lee. Lee Kwan Lee Kwan Lee Kwang Ju. <laughs> Lee Kwang Ju. Something like that. I don't know if he's the one that was responsible. I was meeting up with some people in Pretoria and this young guy from Pretoria, or that, that's at the University of Pretoria, told me this and I, I made a video about it. He said one of the things he believes Singapore got right in developing very quickly and one of the things we got wrong as a post-apartheid South Africa. In Singapore, they invested a lot in basic skills and the education of basic skills. Everyone who was going through school, finishing school was like, I'm going to be a plumber. I'm going to be an electrician. I'm going to become a mechanic. I'm going to become a bricklayer. Everyone was focused on the basics. We're going to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you are a developing nation, you are meant to build a strong foundation. And black South Africans in their mindset of running away from Bantu education, in their mindset of we want to live like whites, they jumped steps, which is very different from what the Afrikaners did when they took over from the British. They didn't rush to say, well, we are farmers. We are now just going to be lawyers and doctors. They were like, we need to build. And they still have that mindset now at Orania and the Afri forums and what they do. I think it's they get it from there. We wanted to jump. You come from a township or maybe a squatter camp, an informal settlement. And in your head, you want to move from there and become an actuarial scientist. When you look at the problems of your nation or where you come from, your neighborhood, which is what this guy was saying, Singapore got right. Every child in that township is meant to be like, our goal is going to learn construction, how to build 
nice fancy homes, how to build nice paved roads, how to ensure that we have flowing water. We're all going to learn how to build a foundation so that our children will then become the nurses and the teachers and their children will become the lawyers and the accountants and the whatever. And over time, this was the way the story started with him. Over time, Singapore started phasing out the basic jobs because they no longer needed them because everything had been built. And he says one of the issues we have in South Africa is we've even closed the FET colleges and skills development institutions because no child wanted to go and study those things. Everyone wanted to go and get a degree. And that's why we've got this issue now. And now we're going to foreigners. And sometimes you'll get a white Afrikaans man who's coming to fix your blocked toilet because black South Africans don't want to do those jobs. And for me, the, the lesson was never mind the country, just look in our own families at the things we are chasing and the basics that we haven't fixed. Where in our extended families, they're still living in RTPs, they're still living in townships. And some of us are trying to live in Dubai when we haven't been able to fix this. And if you're going to invest in the education of your cousins, your nieces and nephews, try and invest more in the, in the construction and the building of the things. So that if some of them are talented and want to have high paying professions, it's like at least back home we've built the basic infrastructure. I hear you and I hear the argument of Africans always trying to compare themselves with Asia and uh, Singapore. But what we do when we make those comparisons is we never look at who these countries are and whether their circumstances are the same to us. Mm. So you are like a child who came up in a township in a poor family trying to compare yourself with your next door neighbor who's got a rich uncle or rich parents mm -hmm. and trying to think that your circumstances are the same and then trying to use that blueprint for yourself. You can't. Who is Singapore? What is Singapore? Where did Singapore come from? And what is its position in the current value chain and uh, uh, value system? Mm -hmm. Singapore is a former British colony that currently repairs mm -hmm. British American ships when they are mm -hmm. passing the Straits of Amor. I think that's, that's what we call it. They are strategically placed where they are to have a U.S. base, a, a British base, and to repair ships. So that was one of the industries that they had. Number two, 60% of Singaporeans are Chinese people. Then I think another 13% are Indian, and then so forth and so on. Why is that important? It's important because Singapore is at the tip of China in the South China Sea. And their job, when China was close to the world, was to be the gateway point for European companies to put in their products into China through Singapore, through the Chinese citizens that were living in Singapore, and to also do the same to India. Then they also then, from providing just products, repairing products, they began to manufacture the products because there was a gateway to China and the uh, four billion people market of South Asia. Then, once they had started getting the products in and they were making so much money from that, they then gave that job to other countries, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and then they began to do the banking and the financing. Mm. Then China opened up. By that time, they were already occupying a very strategic position of springboarding Western products into a 4 billion, billion people market. Now imagine if you're a middleman for a 4 billion people market, mm. how much money do you think you can make in the process? Mm. You're going to be rich. So how many other countries can be a Singapore? Very few. South Africa is the closest thing to Afri in Africa to a Singapore in that South Africa is a gateway and a springboard for companies to enter into the African market. Correct. And you'll see that South Africa is also prosperous because of that. Mm. Will it be a Singapore? It's difficult for it to be a Singapore because Africa is not a 4 billion people market. Mm. And Africa wasn't targeted by the West to become the factory of the, of, of the world. So therefore, the West were willing to put technology, education, knowledge, and finance to industrialize Asia, to make it an industrial uh, hub and, an, in, and, and the manufacturing uh, uh, factory of the world. Africa is a low-cost resource extraction center. It is deliberately denied education, deliberately denied investment, deliberately denied technology. Those are the positions we are in. You will not be a Singapore in Africa unless you create the conditions for yourself, but the West is not going to help you to get there because you're supposed to be for extraction of resources. Mm. 
Asia, most Asian countries were given the Marshall Plan. They were lent money by the West after the Second World War, and they were even given reparations from Japan. Many people don't know that. All this makes Asia totally different to Africa. And even when people say, yeah, but Asian countries were at this point when Zimbabwe got its independence, they were at that point, but they were getting money, investment, technology, and assistance to develop industry while you were being denied and deindustrialized. The two are not the same. However, you do bring points of what we can learn from them. But when you've got an economy that doesn't have a middle class, you can have as many plumbers as possible. They're never going to make much money. That's why you see the FET colleges that teach plumbing were not viable because kids would look at their uncles who were plumbers who were not making money because there's too many plumbers, too many builders. Right now, there are few builders and few plumbers. So the Zimbabwean guy comes in, does well, and then you start saying, oh, we should have continued plumbing school. No, it wasn't working. It wasn't working because there were too many plumbers, too many skilled people, and there were not enough jobs because the white guys occupied that level. They are the plumbers. They are the uh, electricians. They get the real lucrative jobs, and the crumbs that fall off the table are not enough for somebody to go and do a course for three years to learn so that he can be paid mediocre and peanuts. So this is something we must always know and remember. The white plumbers do well because they, they are dealing with the middle class of white South Africans who have the money and companies and corporates where they make the money. But it's not only the plumbing that you have this problem. Look at us. We're marketers, communicators. We are accountants. You see accountants living like paupers in South Africa. You see accountants who work for themselves. I mean, um, um, lawyers who work for themselves in South Africa living mediocre lives. Mm -hmm. All he does is go and bail out Botsotsi. That's how he makes his money. No one will give him a brief. Too many lawyers. It'll be like that with every other profession. That's why you see people stay away from certain professions because there's not enough of a black economy. This 7% all black people are fighting for is not enough to take care of plumbers, electricians, and everybody in this economy. So that's why when we say restitution is very important, which is what happened to Asia, we mean it. That's how Israel is able to support its plumbers and its electricians. Is they don't have a tier of people who colonize them above them, then, then them. No, they're controlling the whole country alone. They were given reparations of over $100 billion to build their country and to assist their country. Then others, Jewish people were dominating all across the world, send money home. I want to disagree with you so much, but I'm going to hold my tongue. <laughs> um, <laughs> your concerns have been noted. Uh, the only thing I will add is, you're very right, there's a lot to, to be learned. And people need to, when they acquire skills, try and not acquire them for the purpose of, yeah. of a job. Making money. And the example I was making was not for a job, but it was to actually build an economy wh where you are, wherever that is. Yeah. Uh, any of, it's not any of, your closing remarks, please. Right. So, yeah. Um, I Even think, if it's about your life, the work you're doing, etc. I think one thing I would like to leave us with is that we need to deconstruct the um, propaganda system of communication and knowledge that is currently around us. We have to acknowledge that that communication system and uh, media system that is in South Africa at this present moment in most of Africa is an apartheid uh, system built in a crime against humanity and should be treated like Nazi communication propaganda machinery was treated. Must be cancelled, must be destroyed, and we need a new creation of a new communication system and media system that is for the people and that reinforces the cultural values of the people and doesn't lie and destroy people to make them the most delusional or the most misperceptive people in the world, which is what is happening to South Africa and most of Africa, where our enemy is the one that's giving us information to destroy our sense of being, to destroy our minds, and to destroy our aspirations, to keep us as slaves and to keep us subjugated people. Done. Done. Rutendo Matsinyarare, thank you so much for coming through and I look forward to our next sit down. I always appreciate you and I think our audience really appreciates you and everything they get to learn and everything that gets triggered. Thank you so much. Catch up with you soon. I had somebody who called me from prison. He's in Westville, Durban. And he says, I watch, we watch your videos here every day and I'm working to start um, turning your videos into Zulu so that we can spread them to more people. But you inspire a lot of people here in prison. I was like, wow. Yeah. 
assembled. That is that is the propaganda that we are deconstructing, decolonizing, and we're infiltrating with an alternative voice. Thank you. Thank you. I've got I had an interview that uh, someone wanted me to do.